even though um, from my experience here in um, Taiwan over the last nine days, I'm not sure that you have many sunny days. That's so <laughs> still least uh, to be seen. Um, I'd like to again thank my host, um, Kwang Sing, for a wonderful last nine days. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank other members of this team um, for all the hospitality that they showed me um, uh, on my visit. And um, to begin then, um, and to also respond to the charge, a question, the plea that I situate the Caribbean as part of the process of beginning this talk, it's actually a relatively easy thing to do for this speaker, or this thinker that I'm going to be working through, unfolding, and speaking about today. Because her life, in many ways, encompasses many of the major movements and questions and um, and perspectives that Caribbean thinkers have wrestled with over the last eight years. Um, Sylvia Winter was born in Cuba and returned to Jamaica. Uh, she was born of Jamaican parents when she, um, she came back to Jamaica when she was very young, um, about two or three years old. She was born in Cuba in 1928. And she's still with us today, living, uh, retired now in Oakland, California, about to celebrate her 88th birthday. And um, so she experienced as a child the very formative and important 1930s labor rebellions in the Caribbean that have spoken of in the last couple of sessions. Um, for those who are not aware of them, um, in the Caribbean, as we, as we know, um, in the Anglophone Caribbean, for a couple hundred years, who were largely slave societies and economies. Um, in the 1830s, emancipation came. However, for 100 years after that, um, while there were many intriguing and slow glacial um, changes in the class um, dynamics in the society, and one of the most important um, social structure changes that took place was the um, coming of indentured um, laborers from Asia in that period of time. Um, it was not until the 1930s labor rebellions that we saw a seismic shift in the Caribbean. With the 1930s labor rebellions, we saw the rise of trade unions, modern political parties for the first time, and um, a process was irrevocably put in place, which led to universal adult suffrage in most islands in 1951, and then the coming of independence within the Anglophone Caribbean to many of the territories, Jamaica and Trinidad in 1962, Barbados and Guyana in 1966, and many of the other islands in the north between about 1974 and 1983. Um, these islands, of course, all gained independence following the breakup of the short-lived and very lamentably short-lived Caribbean Federation, which lasted from 1958 to 1961. So um, Winter experienced as a child, an event that she spoke of many times, the very formative moment of the 1930s labor rebellions. And in Jamaica, the rebellions were so intense that the colonial government basically collapsed. And um, of course, as we know, this is in 1938, just at the uh, advent, a year later, World War II would start. And um, um, it ushered in um, some very fine um, nationalist leaders who would later take Jamaica into um, independence. But it also irrevocably changed the way that the population saw the colonial rule. Um, Winter herself was a brilliant student. She um, went to London to study um, in the um, 1940s and later on to Spain. And she became, in her travels in Europe, a noted fiction writer, a dancer, a playwright, um, and became part of the Caribbean 
literary movement in the 1960s that were to trans that was going to transform the way in which people saw Caribbean literature and indeed the ways in which people saw the Caribbean. And many of the um, writers at that time are well known to people who study uh, post-colonial literature, people like George Lamming, persons like V.S. Naipaul, uh, persons like Wilson Harris. She also, um, and this of course is part of the incredible ferment of the 1960s, became part of a cultural revolt against colonialism and thus part of a nationalist movement and the preparations for independence that were taking place by uh, intelligentsia who realized that independence required far more than the hoisting of a new flag but a strange, a change in the structure of feeling of the way that people related to their societies. So, um, like the number, she returned to the Caribbean to take up a post teaching at the University of the West Indies Mon Campus in her native Jamaica. So she returned and took up that post in about 1966 and stayed in Jamaica until 1974. In that period of time from 1966 to 1974, which is um, the time period in which I begin the story that I tell today, um, she helped with the co-founding of Jamaica Journal, which is um, one of the major publications, um, um, intellectual um, cultural publications of the Institute of Jamaica, a very noted Caribbean journal. And she offered a series of path-breaking essays on Caribbean cultural and intellectual criticism. She also, and this is where I begin my story, participated in a landmark conference in 1971 at the University of the West Indies Modern Campus in Jamaica. And there in January 1971, she met um, a African-American historian, a guy called Vincent Harding. Um, on meeting Vincent Harding and on conducting a number of radio shows with Vincent Harding, um, they agreed that she should write an essay on the African experience in the Americas for publication by the institute that Vincent Harding then um, headed, which is the Institute of the Black World in Atlanta. Now, the conference at which Winter was at was um, the Association for Commonwealth Literature and Language Studies, um, known as the ACLALS, which was held in the Caribbean for the first time. And um, this organization, which is held every two or three years still, is the major Anglophone literary conference in the world for this thing called Commonwealth Literature. And it was being held in the Caribbean for the first time, and it was seized upon by a number of Caribbean theorists as a way or a point in which they could actually establish something about the nature of Caribbean criticism. So, um, it, um, and it was a critical event in the history of the Mona campus because it was part of a series of activities in the late 60s and 1970s that led to uh, that campus being such a charged, unsettled, and enormously productive intellectual space. So, um, in this time at the Mona campus, you have the emergence of the New World Group, which is a grouping of mainly social scientists who are concerned about creating a form of criticism which, while um, certainly um, was against the liberal Washington consensus, also um, was not, um, did not dovetail squarely with the Marxist form of criticism. Um, there was also the Black Power Movement at this time, the occupation of the Creative Arts Center, and Walter Romney's mesmerizing impact, which of course was curtailed uh, after less than a year when he was denied entry back into Jamaica by the, um, uh, let me say by the Jamaican government, and also the birth of a number of other journals, um, most notably the Journal of Bang, and also the Journal of Coup. And that journal, Savile Coe, under the editorship of Camel Brathwaite, had become the, had actually began the critical labor of charting the contours of a Caribbean literary and aesthetic tradition of criticism. But this particular conference, the ACLALS, was the International Literary Conference at which tensions surrounding this newly emerging Caribbean criticism would explode. 
and it became posed as a number of re irreconcilable polar opposites. So you had on one level the responsibility of the Caribbean intellectual versus the idea of the disinterested writer, which is represented by the contrast between Camel Graftwood and V.S. Paul, and also the allegiance of literary criticism with the folk um, represented by Sylvia Winter versus a very leave-aside type of criticism represented by Kenneth Brownshaw. Now, at the time of ACLALS in January 1971, Winter was a lecturer in Spanish in the Department of Modern Languages at UEMONA, and she was already considered a significant Caribbean cultural theorist due to the work that she had published. However, in this essay that she proposed to Vincent Harding for the Institute for Black World, she decided that she wanted to try her hand at something new. She wanted to move beyond her then Caribbean center of critical essays towards this, a hemispheric conception of the way placed by colonialism on black culture. So she had done a lot of work on Jamaica and the Caribbean, but she said, I want to think about black culture in a hemispheric level. I want to think about it from North America to the Caribbean through the Americas. How do we understand the nature of black culture? And of course, this um, interest by Winter dovetails with the fascination by Caribbean theorists of this period with something called the plantation school and plantation economy at that point in time. So this preliminary sketch that she had was going to expand completely beyond authorial intention. Um, she thought it was going to be an essay. The essay became larger and larger. It became then a 250-page manuscript. She wanted to continue writing. They told her to continue writing. It took her the whole of the 1970s, ended up becoming a 935-page manuscript by the end of it. Okay? And this 935-page manuscript, however, was never published by the Institute of the Black World. Um, and the only part of it that's ever actually been published is um, part of her, is in, is in uh, her 1979 essay called Sambos and Minstrels. And Sambos and Minstrels was actually published in the very first inaugural issue of the journal Social Text, which, as we all know, is one of the major journals of criticism within the United States. Um, and so even though there are excerpts and allusions of the manuscript in a number of her other texts, so you can see in some of her other published articles in the 1970s that she's working through ideas that um, are part of black metamorphosis. And in some cases, there's one paragraph over in black met, um, for, in, from the articles in there. The only part really cons concretely about kind of a 14-page part that's taken directly from the manuscript is that article. Um, Sambos and minstrels. And um, when I discovered this manuscript, um, I was given a copy of it in about 2011, I believe, by a collaborator in the United States. And it took me a while to actually come to terms with it and realize its full importance. But when um, David Scott asked me to join the editorial board of Small Acts in 2013, he simultaneously asked me, okay, well, you know, um, well, actually a few months later, he asked me, hey, you know, um, I usually ask my new associate editors to do a special issue of the journal. Uh, what would you like to do the journal on? Because um, I've invited you to join Small Acts um, to help us with our work on um, Caribbean social, political, and cultural thought, intellectual criticism. I want you to be one of our point people on that. But what would you like to do the special issue on? So um, I thought about it over a moment, but I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And that was a critical interpretation of black metamorphosis. So um, I put together um, a team of um, the top people who do work on Sylvia Winter's work in the world. And I asked six of them to um, read the entire 935 page manuscript and then write an article on it, based partly on it, but based on their own thought and their own work and their own ideas. So um, I had to be quite persuasive to ask them to read a 900 page manuscript and then basically do that. But they all did, and it's actually the new issue of Small Apps. It's just been published about 10 days or so ago. It's come out. And um, one of the reasons that um, I devoted a couple of years to that project is because Black Metamorphosis is a very remarkable document. It, and I believe it deserves a great deal of close study. Um, it's arguably the most important unpublished non-fiction work by an Anglophone Caribbean intellectual. Okay, I can't think of a single manuscript that I've heard of 
that anywhere near is a sort of sort of scope and importance of black metamorphosis published by Anglophone Caribbean Intellectual. It's also a very major guide to the transition in Winter's thought, mainly from her work on the Caribbean and black America in the 1960s and 70s, to what we would refer to as the her theory of the human from the 1980s onwards. Because to pick up another part of the intellectual biography story of Winter, in 1974 she goes to the United States, first to um, University of California, California, San Diego, I believe it was at that time. Um, and she's drawn there due to the expansion of um, the programs around black criticism at that point in time. And, um, she stays in the United States. Three, three years later, she actually goes to Stanford. And she stays at Stanford then to the end of her um, career when she retires in 1997. And um, she, her work shifts over time to um, work which is Black Hemisphere and its orientation in the 1970s. But then in, from 1984, she starts to produce a series of exceptional essays on the meaning of what she would turn um, the quest for Western, um, the quest for the human after Western man. And um, a number of those essays have been dazzlingly um, cited and are considered around some of the most path-breaking work of, um, that has been published over the last 30 years. Um, I do not speak lightly when I say that Sylvia Winter is considered by many people to be the finest living Anglophone therapy philosopher. Okay? And, um, and the shift that she actually makes from Marxism, um, Caribbean studies and black studies, towards the theory of the human is something that we can see anticipated in black metamorphosis. So, Black Metamorphosis really, in many ways, is a connecting document for those of us who study her work, between her work mainly on the Caribbean um, and her work on the theory of the human. There's that space in between, which when we understand Black, non black Metamorphosis, we then understand um, the, um, the um, many things about Winter's development over that period of time. Okay. It's also a more sustained discussion of the politics of black culture in America. And um, so it's this fascinating full-length manuscript about the United States by an intellectual from outside of the United States, and particularly a black intellectual. Um, in the Caribbean tradition, the, um, the only other text of that kind of ambition and size I can easily think of is C.L.R. James's American Civilization, which she wrote in the early 1950s. And there are many striking differences between the texts that we could perhaps discuss in question time. Okay? Um, finally also, Winter's Black Metamorphosis is also one of the most compelling interpretations of a black experience in the Western Hemisphere ever written by a Caribbean intellectual. Okay? So um, when we see it from the perspective of her whole oeuvre, it is one of her most compelling, sustained renditions of the black experience of New World coloniality, okay? And one of the most compelling ones in the entire canon of African diasporic, uh, diasporic letters. And even saying that it is one of the best, um, if not perhaps the best, is still not quite safe enough. Now, um, I want to start the, my direct discussion of um, black metamorphosis with this particular quote from it. And um, it's drawn from page 428, so it's almost in the middle of the text. And it's actually a the part of the section of the text that I said was republished in the journal Social Text, a very inaugural issue of Social Text. It was the pain, the angst of those posited as non-norms that compelled examination of the functioning of the symbolic order itself. Now, Sylvia Winter commences Black Metamorphosis with a declaration that its intention is, and I quote, to explore the historical process, the socio-economic sea change, the cultural metamorphosis by which a multi-tribal African 
became the native of that area of experience that we term the New World. And the daring and the breathtaking scope of this statement announces a text devoted to wide-reaching socio-historical transformation across centuries and a cultural history of the African presence in the New World. The wonder that Winter could attempt this at all, though, can partially be explained by the historical conjuncture in which she's actually writing. She's writing, remember, within five years of her first programs in Black Studies at U.S. universities, in which the main um, responsibility is seen as to disenchant the fictions of a Eurocentric academy and to produce new knowledge in the pursuit of human freedom. Um, so Black Metamorphosis, um, when it is finally published, is going to give scholars of African diaspora studies a lot to consider um, based on her theories of cultural transformation in the Americas. Okay? Um, but what I think gives its text this most enduring power is the idea that black experience matters. That black experience is decisive to comprehending that the new world constitutes what she would term a distinctive area of experience. And it's an area of experience unparalleled in the past history of humankind, which Winter, a point which Winter would return to over and over later on in her work. Black experience is a crucial though, because without understanding black experience, the ideological fictions of a contemporary world order, which consists continue to consign the vast majority of its population to a subhuman status, remain uncontested, and they grow every generation in weight and power. And Winter's tale then of black experience spans 900 pages. And it's filled with all of these theoretical speculations on the social, political, and ascetic features of black life in the Western Hemisphere. And she inaugurates a number of key terms and extends other ideas vital for comprehended black existence. So she inaugurates terms like the underlying, indigeneity, the, the idea of the non-norm, as we see in this quote I have up, the idea of the plantation archipelagos, marginal archipelago the colonization of consciousness. And all of these are rendered into a manuscript of a conceptual reach across centuries, leaving no sphere of modern existence, political, social, economic, religious, cultural, untouched. Okay. And um, if we think then about another great text which deals with this question of black experience, um, we may actually want to go and turn to our friend Franz Fanon and black skin white mass. And um, we may look at an important part of black skin white mass, which is derived actually from its fifth chapter, which I have up before you. Ontology does not permit us to understand the being of the black man. For not only must the black man be black, he must be black in relation to the white man. The black man has no ontological resistance in the eyes of the white man. And these words are Fanon's words um, from the fifth chapter of Black Skin, White Mass. And um, that chapter was, has been translated in 1967 translation as a fact of blackness. But the literal translation of that is actually the lived experience of the black. Okay? And Fanon's journey of feeling an event in an anti-black world is one of the most searing descriptions of its kind in Africana letters a reflection on invisibility, hypervisibility, and black embodiment rarely surpassed in poignancy or influence. The journey of this idea of lived experience to Fanon, as Lewis Gordon has recently shown, came through Simon um, de Beauvoir, who in turn was actually indebted to Richard Wright. And this is a pathway not without significance for black metamorphosis. Because for of the many texts that Winter consults in Black Metamorphosis, it is Richard Wright's Black Boy the, um, that is a book that she persistently returns to throughout the text and allows her to theorize a transition away from a, a Marxist determined theory of black liberation towards an illuminating, though unfinished, schema where black experience determines any conceptualization of black past and black futures. The moment of Black Boy, and I don't know if anybody has read Black Boy by Richard Wright, but Black Boy um, actually is a very special text to me because I read it when I was 15 years old. I think it was the first um, major text of African American literature that I read. It really put me on a particular pathway um, to thinking about the black experience. But um, it's also um, 
one of the best, if not the best account that I can think of, if you want to understand what life growing up for a black person in the deep south of the United States was in the first couple of decades of the 20th century, that is the book to go to and to read, okay, without a doubt. Um, and the moment in Black Boy that Winter actually um, takes up is a terrible scene of repression and victimization by the young Wright, Richard Wright, uh, by his white co-workers, Peace and Reynolds. And in her initial discussion of this scene, Winter discussed and suggests that Peace and Reynolds' racism is actually secured by economic considerations given force by colonialism. So she'll say that devalued black labor meant a relative overvaluation of their labor. Okay. But later on in the manuscript, in the development of her argument, the economic motive becomes secondary to a consideration of what she would term the pathology of whiteness, which itself is a cousin of the pathology of a colonizer and the bourgeoisie. The behavior of Peace and Reynolds is an illustration of their desire for racial mastery that demands recognition from blacks, recalling he Hegel's ideas about lordship and bondage, but only if threaded through a phenomenon gaze. For while not in disputing Irene Gandesier's assessment of the influence of Hegel's work on Fanon, Winter will argue that if Hegel's influence is central, even more central is the ground of Fanon's experience of being black in a white world. The non-reciprocity of signification is a foundation of a settler native division, as for Winter, the master-slave model is essentially the model of the norm-non-norm the norm, non -norm model. Okay. The way out of what Fanon called this infernal cycle is not the security of negritude, as he showed so well in the lived experience of the black. Writing in the 1970s, Winter recognized this well, but insisted on the productive resistance negritude proffered to global cultural blackitude and consequently a subversion of a norm non norm model as, and um, returning to that quote again, it was the pain the angst of those positive as non norms that compelled examination of the functioning of a symbolic order itself. Um, so in other words, Winter R. Um, Wilson gives a very partial and not partial defense of negritude. She's not going to say that negritude did not slip into certain kinds of essentialism, certainly. But at the same time, she's saying at least negritude offered a contestation of that non-non-norm, that incredible French assimilationist colonialist policy, and offers something outside what she would call that cultural blackitude. Okay? Um, this constant fashioning of blacks as a non-norm, what Richard Eitan will call their persistent status as outliers in the modern nation state, demands centering the experience of coloniality rather than class domination as key to the other practices of societies in the Western Hemisphere. Black suffering is an overlooked phenomenon in our contemporary world, as we all know. It is angrily denied by many, is a victim of a version of historical amnesia and bad faith that we give the term anti-black racism. This long-sustained agony of black experience would find its zenith in a contemporary site combining terror and captivity. And here, Winter, in a very prescient way, because remember this is being written in the 1970s, let's hear what she says. The ghettos and prisons of today's North America are the new forms of a plantation archipelago. The new forms of a plantation archipelago are not, as were the old forms, the sites of a system of industrial colonization, but rather a reservation, uh, where those now inscribed as expendable by the system of production can be heard in, to repeat in contemporary terms the protracted agony of the American Indian. So in other words, she's positing then the prison as a new reservation. Um, and her anticipation here of what will two decades later become known in academic and activist circles as a prison industrial complex is remarkably prescient and is as revelatory as her search for a radical anti-colonial praxis which would hasten its demise. Um, and here she will say this as part of that radical anti-colonial praxis. It is the natives, all the wretched of the earth, who, breaking out of their reservation, are now called upon to reinvent the very concept of the human through a restructuring of the world system created by the discovery and conquest of the new world by the West. Uh, this is written, of course, in the heady days of 1970s black power. 
We know only too well, however, that this uprising that Winter saw as possible in the late 1970s when these wars were written would never come to pass. The specter of the neocolonial dominance of 40 years later was close to unimaginable at the time, and the dreadful reversals in the socio-economic conditions of people of African descent throughout the world are known to achingly to rehearse. Now, Winter had a suspicion of this impending gloom to come, seen in her references to the 1978 regents of the University of California versus BAT decision of the U.S. Supreme Court. And this was the first decision by the U.S. Supreme Court which really goes against affirmative action and those progressive policies, policies of the late 60s, 1970s. And this is a very important early salvo in the reaction and response to civil rights, which is going to re um, uh, reach a crescendo in the following years. Okay? However, Black Metamorphosis also gives its readers Winter's understanding of just how challenging the struggle to effect radical change is going to be. And central to that challenge to um, effect radical change is what she referred to as the social dominance of the bourgeoisie. Okay? And um, if you give me one more. And um, in thinking through this question about the social dominance of the bourgeoisie, um, and in the process of writing Black Metamorphosis, Winter actually gives up on her earlier conviction that the primary factor in the consolidation of white supremacy in America was a series of economic forces unleashed by colonialism and transatlantic um, slavery. Because one of the fascinating things about um, encountering this text is that you can see Winter working through and revising her opinions. So she actually has a, a number of fascinating moments in which she abruptly changes her tone. So the fact that it's an unpublished text, even though it's a complete manuscript, makes it a very interesting working document and thinking document to encounter. Okay? So early in the text, um, white terror upon black bodies is figured as a disguise through which an ideology based on super exploitative labor relations masks itself. Um, so Winter would say early in the text that racism was in the last instance determined by the profit motive. So she said, look, the thing about racism that we need to understand is, is that racism is just there to facilitate the super exploitation of black bodies. So yes, um, in other words, um, we know that white working class bodies are used and exploited by the capitalist system, while black bodies can be, um, can be done so tenfold by the existence of racism, and that's the purpose of racism. However, this is a preliminary analysis of racism by Winter, and she could thus state here, cultural racism thus plays an economic role. Okay? That would be her position earlier on. However, even that moment in Winter's uh, formulations on racism is faced with a number of doubts and a number of caveats. And some of these caveats are the dialectic of the African as native labor, the status of blacks as property, rather than as a class excluded from bourgeois property rights. Okay? Because black people are actually property under slave systems. You see, they're not just excluded from bourgeois property rights. And midway through the manuscript, in a very arresting paragraph, Winter actually repudiates her earlier convictions, moving from a theory of the black stereotype as a mechanism to facilitate the production of a super exploitive population to this stereotype as intrinsic to domination throughout the system. Okay? So she actually makes this leap here at a particular point on page 429 of the text. I'm going to read you the actual passage in which she does this, just simply because the passage is um, so candid and so interesting in many ways. So she says the following, and these are exact words. I would like at this point to contradict an earlier formulation. At the beginning of the monograph, I define the sample stereotype as a mechanism by which more surplus value can be extracted from relatively devalued labor. I would tend now, however, to see the Sambo stereotype as a mechanism which is far more central to capitalism's functioning as a mode of domination. That is, I would see its function in extracting surplus as secondary to its function of permitting a mode of domination to be generalized at all levels of the system. And she says at another point, though, also, when she's still you know, in this um, transition, she says, 
Earlier on in this manuscript, I had accepted the Marxist privileging of the economic, but that was to take a central effect for a cause. Nigger breaking was directed towards an essentially social purpose. Okay? In other words, it's not just about the economic purpose, it's about a social purpose. Okay? And this, of course, requires more than slightly stretching Marx in the colonial situation, as Fanon once observed. But Marx is decentered, though he is not abandoned, because he's key to the winter's target in the last half of her text which is, of course, her, and her target is the bourgeoisie. Because while Winter cites approvingly Marx's famous dismantling of the legitimation tactics of the Western bourgeoisie, in Marx's um, ringing and incredible words from um, um, his chapter 26 of Das Kapital, volume one, The Secret of Primitive Accumulation, and I'm thinking of the part in which Marx talks about the insipid childishness preached to us in defense of, proper, of, uh, of property. The drama of coloniality for Winter requires a critique beyond even that imagined in Marx's exposure of the social reorderings and upheavals unleashed by capitalism. For Winter, the power and effectiveness of the bourgeois order was that it ultimately allowed for the self-expression of no other group except on the condition that the group expressed itself in bourgeois forms. Its guaranteed freedom of expression was limited to the freedom of bourgeois expression. That is to say, it imposed the form of its expression on every other form in its vicinity." End quote. Bourgeois hegemony is therefore not an idle phrase, because for Winter, by its nature, the bourgeoisie must be culturally totalitarian, or the bourgeoisie must cease to exist. Comprehending race means appreciating that all racisms are finally bourgeois. It is a bourgeois social order that needs a rigid, rigid, fixed, individual, separated self. The tactics of force and consent, co-optation and vicarious identification result in blacks, workers and women being intimately interlocked in a system in which their other, respectively white, middle class and male, constitutes a normative identity, a central feature of the bourgeois mode of domination. This aspirational quest then for whiteness and attendant betrayals of the black bourgeoisie within the system are to be expected, okay? Because the black bourgeoisie, of course, understands it's that, um, that its role and its function is to basically become white, okay? By the conclusion then of this text, Winter's position is practically reversed from that earlier position that we quoted. So she'll say towards the end of this text, now on page 919, she'll say, the particular wrong of the black, his total social exploitation, cannot be fought except as it is fought as a general social rather than merely economic wrong that it is. So note the shift that she's making here. So rather than as an area of an experience that may give a universal paradigm similar to the proletarian experience, dominant understandings of the black experience in the US represent it as a racial experience. This winter would argue against, as a black experience shows the inextricability of the infrastructure and the superstructure, and the black revolt is the most radical of all revolts as it aims at the cold. The black presence in the new world is therefore subterranean but omnipresent, fugitive but hyper-visible, condemned as a non-norm and non-person, but simultaneously the foundation for the concept of free citizenship in the Americas. Think of Haiti. Think of what the Haitian Revolution actually inaugurates in the New World, the first republic in the New World in which slavery is abolished for all time. Okay? The monumental importance of this area of experience that we call the New World is that the black-white code is a central inscription and division that generates all of the other hierarchies. And so Winter will say, the secret of capitalism is not to be found in the factory. It is to be found on the plantation. Okay? <laughs> um, this allows Winter to not only resolve a theoretical tension within her argument, that, but to extend her thoughts deeper into the meaning of black experience mediated through culture. She would propose that we substitute, rather than using the concept alienation, she says no, let's use the concept the colonization of consciousness. Because the black person who accepts himself to be a Negro is not alienated, he's colonized. 
Okay? Here, then, the central, essential theoretical hope for comprehending the dyna dynamic dialectic of terror and hope that constitutes the history of blacks in the New World must lie within black experience itself. Now, desire plays a crucial role here, both as its analysis of colonialism and in presenting the pathways of assimilation and resistance, which in different iterations remain the hallmarks of black sociopolitical traditions. What winter terms the carefully cultivated sentimental passion of the bourgeois cult of feelings is a corollary in the realm of desire of the European humanism that phenomena did not so spectacularly in the cop conclusion to the wretched of the earth. Fanon's black skin's white mass open theory to the exploration of a central strategy of bourgeois domination, its strategy of the imitation of desire. The coloniality of power through desire is revealed through the following statement. It is through the totalitarian colonization of desire that bourgeois hegemony activates its strategy of power. Simultaneously though, black culture would produce heretical ways of being capable of dismantling the entire bourgeois mode of being. So the yearning of the spirituals that awaken W.B. Du Bois to the gift of black culture to humanity is a powerful expression of uncolonized desire. And here um, we're th I'm thinking about, um, let me see, Du Bois' The Souls of Black Folks, of course, okay? Uh, listen to Du Bois and The Souls of Black Folks from 1903. The Negro folk song, the rhythmic cry of a slave, stands not only as a sole American music, but as the most beautiful expression of human experience, born this side of the seas. It remains as a singular spiritual heritage of a nation and the greatest gift of the Negro people." End quote. Black music in the late 20th century then is going to become a commercial anodyne, but it contains at the same time its jamis face of subversive desire. And here Winter will say the following. It is in this decolonization of consciousness, this degradation of social fictions, that links the collective popular black culture and the theoretical formulations of black intellectuals. Black music, from blues to jazz to soul, and its multiple de uh, derived variants, counters the social fiction of managed organizational capitalism that the consumption of more and more consumer goods is a goal-seeking activity of man, one that diminishes pain and increases pleasure. And um, I'm going to go on to continuing that quote, okay? Rather, black music sings that is always done of an absence, a lack of happiness, an absence, lack, felt in the flesh, and occasioning a radicalization of desire that secularizes utopian longings, the kind that cannot be satisfied by the dominant social order. Under the commercialization of the music, it infiltrates this radicalization of desire and exists as a leaven of a society at a mass popular level. The black popular then, what we're saying is that particularly in the form of music, is where we may say intimations of the human in our presently anti-black world. Black music is an underground reservoir of cultural heresy through which black reinvention, constitution, and transformation both expresses itself and becomes possible. It engenders a psychic state of feeling necessary for black revolt as the black oral tradition culture in the Americas has functioned as a sustained and prolonged attempt to reinvent the black as human in the face of intolerable pressures, material and psychic. Yet the secret of black music is beyond its subversive value. Rather for winter, out of another dispossession, out of another middle passage of a spirit, reggae, and reggae is really now uh, ascending to a lot dominance in the 1970s, like the blues, like jazz, articulates a revolutionary demand for happiness on the part of the wretched of the earth, the global natives of all races disrupted from their traditional cultures into 20th century terror. So, black music is thus an ethical blueprint for black life. It provides spaces of imagination for other forms of being and is central to the making of a new person beyond coloniality. Black happiness in an anti-black world is an achievement in itself, or as the great African-American poet Nikki Giovanni once said, black love is black wealth. Okay? 
Um, at its best, the politics of black culture demand a continual critique in the third world of all secular messiahs exposed of the, as a new class of a skilled bourgeoisie. There is simply no revolutionary praxis without revolutionary counter representation. So radical social change is inconceivable without anti-colonial thought and practice. Neither Marxism nor black cultural nationalism are the answer for winter, as neither can fully address the stigmatization of blackness as deviance, as the epitome of the non-norm. Since, since it is inequality itself that defines the non-norms, it is constitutively fruitless to advance integration, the most terrible form of black alienation, as a solution to the problems of racial apartheid in America and beyond. The weight of coloniality on black lives is both an unbearable burden and a responsibility. And here Winter will say the following, okay? Um, in one of the most poignant parts of this incredible manuscript. The chain of innovations by which blacks have reconstituted new social identities, new social bodies, has reached the limit of its countercultural underlying existence. Either blacks will be destroyed, or blacks will be compelled to impel the social transformation of a chaotic and disintegrating social order. And think about this. Winter is writing this in the 1970s before Reaganism and Thatcherism and global neoliberalism. Okay? And what she is saying is, is that um, there is a limit okay, to this kind of underlife existence, even expressed through black culture. Either black people are going to be destroyed, or black people are going to be compelled to impel the social transformation of the social order, okay? And they're going to be compelled to do that because they are going to be, they continue to be the epitome of the non-norm, okay? It doesn't matter what cloaks they put themselves in, okay? So you can be Henry Louis Gates, and you can be the most prominent black intellectual in the United States, and you can still be arrested by the police when trying to um, get into your own house, as he was a few years ago, as we remember, okay? And um, the wonder, really, of this text also is the fact that there are abundance of paragraphs of a similar power. So there's another one on another page, laid down in the text 918, in which Winter will say, um, in a similar passage to this, Blacks, by the nature of their experience, must de delegitimate the cultural signification systems, the cultural hegemonic imperialism, by which all modes of expropriation of wealth and power are legitimated and carried out. And here, Winters um, echoes C.L.R. James's reflections on Fanon's Wretched of the Earth, uh, because James didn't um, write much about Fanon, but there was a particular 1967 speech that he gave in Detroit, which is not very well known, in which he comments in this manner on Fanon. And we can see Winter in the passage that I have above actually echoing that particular passage. And this is what James has to say about Fanon. Fanon calls his work, his book, Les Damnés de la Terre. It is translated as a wretched of the earth, but I prefer the condemned of the world, which of course would be the literal translation. I want to end by saying this. The work done by black intellectuals, stimulated by the needs of the black people, had better be understood by the condemned of the earth, whether they're in Africa, the United States, or Europe. Because if a condemned of the earth do not understand their past, and know the responsibility that lie upon them in the future, all of the earth will be condemned. That is the kind of world in which we live. So the stakes for Winter and James can never be clearer. The colonial condemnation has been a lot of blacks will extend to encompass humanity. If the wisdom and experience of African diaspora populations, those who have been forced to pay the highest psycho-existential price for the Euro-American West victory is ignored. And this is a simultaneous warning and hope that James and Winter could announce at the end of the 1960s in terms of this particular passage, at the end of the 1970s in this passage, before the advent of global neoliberalism, and of course the environmental questions that question human survival on this planet, which of course are now omnipresent within our times. Okay? And um, 
Let me see. The stakes then in our contemporary neoliberal world order is the very legitimacy of colonized persons' lives and the right of their bodies to exist. And, and to bring it back to the contemporary point and the contemporary moment, I'm here thinking also about the NHISA that I distributed to you, which was um, a letter that Winter wrote called um, On No Humans Involved. Uh, which she wrote in the aftermath of the Rodney Rights of 1992, which has a considerable amount of precedence today, given why everything that's happening with Black Lives Matter in the United States. Okay? Um, I will move towards a conclusion by saying this. At a time in which uh, America may be headed to a culmination of racial insurrection and state-sponsored violence um, towards black people, only witnessed previously in 1919 and 1968 in the past century. Winter's articulation of a black experience of New World coloniality, written, revised, and extended through the 1970s, appears even more prescient and of lasting value. In her later texts, the invocation of the beyond presses us to disenchant the legacy of colonialism towards the human after Western man. Somewhere between colonial abduction as constant and the beyond as possibility lies a black experience of new world coloniality. Thank you. in terms of 1968 and the rise of black power in the Caribbean. Um, the 1970 black power 
um, rebellion in Trinidad was also very significant. They would have been tied to, let's say, what would have was happening in Paris or Mexico, for example, but they would certainly have also have been influenced by what was happening in the United States in terms of um, the civil rights movement. You, were, you, were, you may recall that Stokely Carmichael, who coined so um, phrase black power, is Trinidadian. Okay? Um, and actually, he came to speak in a couple of Caribbean territories um, in the late 60s, early 70s. Hilariously, the Trinidad government banned him from speaking in his own country where he was born. Okay? Mm -hmm. The Barbados government didn't ban him, but they put him on basically a 48-hour visa, okay? And they had special branch of the police forces following him wherever he went, okay? Um, so that's what that's how they handled um Stokely Carmichael. Um, so um, that would have been the moment that that would have been the effect, but certainly global global events always have a direct and very fast impact on the Caribbean due to the size of the countries and due also to the fact that the countries in terms of their population, um, their size and their incredibly large diaspora communities are far more connected and often in tune with what's going on in the rest of the world than um, one might think. Okay? Um, I used to tell my Canadian students that, you know, um, people from the Caribbean know far more about what is happening here than you know about what is going on there. Okay? Um, and that's partly due to the size of the Caribbean diaspora communities um, and, um, and also the fact that when you're on a smaller country, in a smaller island, you're consistently looking out and you have to pay attention to what's going on in the rest of the world. Um, and your question about the plantation archipelago, um, and I should note that even though winter in all of her writings um, remains a Caribbeanist to the extent that one can see the clear influence of her Caribbean background and Caribbean theorists in her work. For most of this text, she's really not talking about the Caribbean at all. She's talking about uh, black America. Um, I mean, the Caribbean finds its way into perhaps the first um, 100 pages or so, and then after that, largely, no, perhaps, uh, there are smatterings of it in the first 200 pages, but after that, it largely disappears. It's little, little of the Caribbean in the last 600 pages, you know, um, directly. A few mentions of reggae and other things, but um, it's not really directly uh, related to the Caribbean at that point in time. But certainly in terms of the plantation archipelago, well, it's a little more complicated than the Caribbean because remember, the Caribbean begins this modern existence as plantations. So the question of traditional modernity in the Caribbean is very different than it is in some other formerly ex-colonial places. Mm -hmm. So um, there is, for example, a famous Nigerian historian called Ajayi who once wrote this essay called Colonialism, an Episode in African History. And he later supposedly like recounted or pulled back from the political assertion he was making there. But um, I mean, the argument, of course, was that we need to see colonialism, that main, the main period of colonialism in many um, sub-Saharan African countries lasts a period of about 60 years or so. An um, argument that Bami Api has also made. Um, I mean, between the Berlin Conference of 1885 and the 16, 1960s decolonization movement. So we need to see it as an episode in a far larger drama of African history, okay? Um, of course, he later, to some extent, um, pulled back from it and said, yeah, well, you know, it's also an incredibly important part of African history. But um, no Caribbean historian or Caribbean theorist is going to write an essay called Colonialism, an episode in Caribbean history, because colonialism has been so constitutive of Caribbean history in a different kind of manner. So um, post, um, the, in the post-independence experience, it was not a matter of trying to go back and um, reclaim or reassert um, centuries, and in some cases, millennium-old cultural traditions, um, and even perhaps social processes have been disrupted by colonialism. Um, one simply could not do that in these territories, because these territories had been, um, let me see, christened by the genocide and born out of slavery. Okay? And those are constitutively parts of how the society had been created. So um, the quest for a particular kind of anti-colonialism or movement beyond colonialism had to find a different pathway than the kind of traditional modernity debates, okay? And the security of them 
that um, I'm not saying they're not contested debates that one could enter into in, let's say, Africa and also the region. Um, um, in terms of that direct question, though, about the um, contemporary Caribbean situation and the political economy there, well, I mean, um, in Anglophone Caribbean, for example, um, certainly the move beyond um, agricultural plantation economies um, has been widespread for the last 30 or 40 years, in which, um, to the extent in which one does not even primarily think of many Anglophone Caribbean countries as producers of agricultural commodities, especially since the decline of banana production in the Eastern Caribbean islands um, of St. Lucia, Dominica, St. Vincent, um, with a collapse of certain trade preferences they enjoyed with the um, European Union <coughs> in the 1990s. Um, but of course, um, the main engine of growth of Caribbean nation states in the last 20, 25 years has been tourism, okay? It's actually been one of the only industries that's actually been expanding. And tourism, of course, brings with it a whole litany of problems. And in some cases, some people have referred to it um, as the new plantation in terms of the model of development, the kind of things that it actually introduce, introduces to the economy, the large-scale transfer of wealth to the outside because the leakage of tourist dollars is incredible, um, and, um, and what it actually means um, for the psyche of people within the country. So, um, so cultural colonization um, continues, but um, certainly in the post-independence era, there's also a very different um, sense of identity and consciousness for people, for that young people have, compared to um, even people of a generation or two generations ago. Um, and it's very interesting, um, even in the Caribbean now, I find, to just even look at about two generations of people, the generation that were um, adults when um, independence came in the 1960s, the generation are like my parents type of generation who would um, now be in their later 60s and retiring but who were teenagers or so at the moment of independence and then the generation like myself who were born firmly after independence, a decade or more after independence and the different perspectives that each has about the country and what's possible um, for the country. Um, there, there, there are many um, um, and the difference in consciousness um, and um, let me see is is um, is quite striking. Okay. Yes. Yes. From the angle of uh, Sydney Olympus, the uh, black metamorphosis, and all let's say related expressions like um, black life, black culture even black uh, happiness, maybe mm -hmm. not uh, black music. Mm -hmm. So what would you say some, something like Obama is? Uh, I mean, Obama as a, let's say, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say it's rather something like um, pathology for this, or a wondrous achievement, or, or what? Uh. That's a nice question. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Let me be, um, begin my take on that more story. Okay? Now, I remember um, in the year of the election campaign, now, first of all, in 2007-2008 academic year, I was at Northwestern University okay, in Chicago as a postdoctoral fellow in African American Studies Department in Chicago in the city where Obama is from. So literally, um, I had a friend who was working um, as a babysitter two houses down from Obama's house, you know, and she pointed out to me where Obama lived in Chicago, okay? Um, I also had conversations with colleagues who know Obama, um, and people I know, I mean, um, I always remember um, uh, one particular um, activist who I know from Toronto who lives in, um, who lives in um, Chicago. Uh, we were having dinner once and I realized that she knew Obama. 
And um, she said, yeah, I know Bam and Michelle and stuff like that. I mean, yeah, we're kind of like, we've chatted and stuff like that. And we talk, we talked a few times with Hangout. And she said, you know, this is still during the primary, so it's no sense so Obama's going to win that. She was there. You know, I was wondering to find out when they were going to realize that he was black, you know, because I'm telling you, um, Michelle's just like us. You know, she was talking about our student group at York University. She's just like us. I mean, she's cool. She's just like us. I mean, those are the kind of people they are. And, you know, we were, we were discussing the various phenomena and the, the things around it. So I know a number of stories about Obama and about Obama's life before he became a politician which um, give me a particular perspective on Obama, okay? However, I have a particular politics, and my politics is, is that if you want to be a president of the United States empire, okay, <laughs> you want to be a president of empire. Um, now, um, among I mean, the many interesting conversations I had basically at that time, I remember one of them was a breakfast um, kind of brunch party at a colleague's house. And I met a guy who was from the Weather Underground that we had a discussion at that time. He was later the person that Sarah Palin made uh, popular. Remember the person who she said was a friend of Obama and Obama was palling around with terrorists? Okay? That was the same person I was speaking to. So apparently I was also palling around with terrorists at that time. But that was before he became famous through Sarah Palin's outing of him as a friend of Obama. But um, um, more directly to the question to the point. Um, I remember there was a cover of either Ebony or Essence at some point um, during the summer of that year, in 2008, which had a picture of Obama on it. And it just simply had, in our time, question mark. And they asked, are we watching the election of the first black president? And I looked at that cover. And I mean, um, Ebony and, Bo and Essence, of course, are bourgeois um, magazines. But I felt so sad when I read that cover. I felt so sad because I knew that there were generations of African Americans who had felt such an incredible amount of prejudice in that place that the one thing that you will always hear people say, we'll never have a black president in our lifetime, you know, and stuff like that. And that's why they were asking, but there was that hope and excitement and that wonder that, could this really be happening? Are we really watching the election of the first black president, okay? By this incredibly gifted, um, uh, let me see, um, intelligent, um, incredible orator, um, one of the best politicians of his generation. I mean, what, what was it, something like a million people went to Berlin when he was a candidate to hear him speak, you know, and, um, and were in Berlin just to hear him speak at that time? But the fact of the matter is, is that um, Obama is a career politician, and he's a career politician who wants to do what career politicians do. I personally think that Obama, in terms of um, his social policies and social interests, is really um, someone fundamentally who's more a Scandinavian, Scandinavian European type model in terms of what he would like, okay? And would have seen himself as trying to pull America onwards from the kind of, um, <laughs> um, let me see, crazy um, kind of Bushes and um, Bush situation in 2008. But Obama, of course, also rescued the bankers okay, and refused to prosecute the bankers. Obama continued to wage terror, terror on people through drone strikes. Obama um, continued and uh, followed um, the model of being a president of the United States Empire. Okay? So I see Obama as actually the epitome of a particular mode of being in which um, the global order um, it's quite comfortable with people like Obama. It works very well. Persons like Obama work very well. It works very well to actually have somebody who is a black man, um, let me see, serving the interests of the U.S. empire. Okay? It makes complete sense within the model. And um, the model, of course, is contradictory because the same model will have the Tea Partiers and the people who are so rapidly racist against it. Okay? But that doesn't mean that one has to be supportive of Obama and Obama's policies um, just because uh, one is um, rapidly against it. I mean, um, I always remember that there were very few colleagues I could actually speak to about this um, during the election year um, globally because there were all of these black. Um, radicals who were um, taking part in this incredible, um, strange phenomena of support for Obama. 
I mean, there, these are people who write of black radicalism, and they're supporting a black elite man to be president of the United States. It was, it was quite bewildering to me. I remember having a conversation with a colleague of mine in which she said, um, you know, people are looking at me in this country, the United States, and saying that they want a black man to be president. They're not really concerned about his politics, because they want, as an example to their children, that you can be anything you want to be in this country, and to, to, for them to see a black president. His response, which I thought was quite wonderful, was, let me tell you, there are about 40 black prime ministers and black presidents around the world, okay? In Africa, the Caribbean, other places. Name me two who are not the enemy of black people. Okay? Yeah. And, that, and that basically is a summation, as far as I'm concerned, of that, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, I can say no. I can say no more at all. I mean, um, it's. Um, I watched um, when he won the election in 2008, and I was completely unmoved. You know, I remember I was with some colleagues who were crying and getting all that and all this foolishness, and I was just, I was just completely unmoved. I thought it was a sad moment because I knew exactly what was going to happen, and I knew exactly how the next eight years were going to unfold. Okay, and I've always had that position, but I mean. Um, it's a, it's a rough one having that position. You know, I got practically thrown out of a dinner party for making that side of comments on side of the party. Yes. So black mask. So hmm? black mask. Black, black mask. Um, black skin. In, in many ways, I mean, what, what's interesting, you know, one of the interesting things about Obama is how careful he is in a way. He's made very few even tactical mistakes in terms of misspeaks and various things in eight years and stuff. Um, and he's a, he's a very, very good politician, but it's that kind of almost sense among black people, of course, that you have to be so much better than a white person to survive and also to succeed. And I mean, they've done studies of this. There's a recent study in which, you know, um, black people always say, well, you know, you have to be twice as good as a white person. But they've actually done studies that have proven some of this in terms of in corporations showing that black people are more likely to be punished for the, uh, harshly for the same infra um, the similar infractions that what their white colleagues will do. They're less likely to be promoted based on objectively the same um, CVs. We know this and stuff. And, um, and um, yes, um, and um, Obama is an example of that. And he works beautifully for the black bourgeoisie class because he's exactly what they represent. They want fundamentally a piece of the global pie, a piece of the local pie and the global pie. It confirms everything that they've thought about themselves and their children. They don't want to transform the society. They just want a situation in which they can also aspire to any site of power and authority locally and globally that they wish to have, okay? And they want it clear that they should be able to do so. Um, their concern is not with, of course, um, global transformation, um, and it's certainly not with um, the black hole. It's actually quite complicated in the argument, so I'm trying to unpack it. Mm -hmm. and Especially the continuation from yesterday discussion. It's not only the black skin, white mask issue involved there, and especially and like you said, sort of the self critique within the Caribbean intellectual, mm -hmm. right? The entire nationalist movement is already that, right? So, so uh, it is the European aspiration mm -hmm. to define the entire uh, anti colonial movement and so on. But I see Winter seem to trying to carve out some space, mm -hmm. right? Almost like I don't know whether this is correct. You know, reminds me of a what should I say? Sort of Foucault's notion of the outside thought, mm -hmm. which is not really outside, but also internal, it's kind of inside out rather than. Especially with the Caribbean, as you, as you said, what constitutes the outside? Nothing, because the whole Caribbean is constituted by colonialism. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what would be the outside, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then Obama, I mean, so so she radically attacks these bourgeoisie, mm -hmm. right? So it must be outside the bourgeois threat, mm -hmm. right? 
So pointing to the reggae and, and so on and so forth, the plantation mm. actually. So um, in a way, the mode of thinking is this. If I, I guess I'm, I'm calling for a certain clarification. Yeah. Is, uh, if we can call that some, some sort of inside out, or outside thought within, mm -hmm. from within, uh, what is that relation? Because it can be understood as binary opposition, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, the black experience defined the non norm, mm -hmm. which is a yeah. binary to the norm, of course, right? But also it is the non norm with the existence of non norm. Mm -hmm. Norm is exposed. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the binary. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, am I under, uh, understanding that you know sort of correctly? And so uh, she pointing to these uh, black happiness. Mm -hmm. So would that be outside the domain of the bourgeoisie, black bourgeoisie, right? Yeah. And what is the relation between Obama bourgeoisie and the Harlem Renaissance, for instance, or the reggae, and uh, which can also be well already always already utilized by Obama, mm -hmm. right? So Obama is part of the. I'm, I'm not trying to say there's, uh, but I, I'm calling for sort of the the mode of thinking, mm -hmm. the thinking logic. Mm -hmm. On winter, mm -hmm. right? Otherwise, it can be misunderstood. This she's reinstating this essentialism yeah. or binary opposition. Let let me first stop here. How mm -hmm. how please okay. clarify? Yeah, I think that the point that you're making mm -hmm. about the question of what is the outside, the difficulty of conceiving of the outside in the context of the Caribbean is part of the key. Um, because what Winter will use in the number for later articles, she uses the idea of the beyond. Okay? So she has a signal article on Caribbean feminist criticism, um, one called Beyond Miranda's Meanings, okay? uh, which has taken up the question of what constitutes Caribbean feminist uh, thinking, of course, playing with the whole idea of the tempest. Okay? Um, she also has a, and that was published in this book called Out of the Cumbler, which is a 1990 text, which is the first set of critical literary essays within Caribbean feminist criticism, so a very important text. Um, she also had a essay, Beyond the Word of Man, on the song, okay? Um, a very influential essay on the song. She had, she published, she's written three major essays on CLR James. Uh, more than she's written on any thinker. But um, the third one is called Beyond the Categories of the Master Conception. And it's a beautiful essay on James. Okay? And she used it, she's used it beyond in a couple of other um, um, type, in a couple of other titles of her essays. It's a constant reoccurring theme. And I think that um, what I said at the end of the paper, let me just get the exact line because it sums up a lot of my thought in terms of response to this. Mm -hmm. um, where I say that somewhere between colonial abduction as constant and the beyond this possibility lies the black experience of new world coloniality. Um, what I'm saying there is this, that um, the beyond for winter is the only alternative <coughs> Uh, the mode of existence that we lie in. It's not through thinking that, and this is where Caribbean experience gives her a great deal of insight. There is no tradition to go back to, okay, that lies outside of coloniality. One can't be seduced by it in the context of the Caribbean. One can't do like the um, civilizationalist Afrocentrists who are almost talking about going back to ancient Egypt, you know? Um, well, they say, yeah, you, you know, yeah, you can't go back in that particular way. You can draw resources mm -hmm. from the past, but you can't go back. Mm -hmm. So you have to see this beyond the coloniality. Mm -hmm. And that's why in her later essays, she has this fabulous invention when she talks about um, constituting the human after Western bourgeois man. Mm -hmm. In other words, what she's saying is that we are all living within the overrepresentation of Western bourgeois man as the very paradigm of the human. Okay? 
And this is something that encapsulates all of us. So it's not that the white man is the enemy. Yeah. It is the figure of Western bourgeois man which is the enemy. Okay, Wh which is the problem. Okay, and that's the reason why all of our societies are rushing helter skelter to aid the consumption practices of Western Europe and North America. Okay. There's a problem associated with that. And that is the fact that the biosphere, the planet, cannot actually stand okay, the production of, or the raising, even though capitalist exploitation will never allow this, the raising of all human beings on the planet to the consumption practices of the West. Okay? And we know that in terms of the planetary environment, the planetary environment cannot actually accommodate that. And so what she's saying is, is that, um, for the sake of humanity, for the sake of the survival of the human species, we need to actually move beyond Western bourgeois man um, towards the human for the first step. Okay? Um, in other words, um, let me see. What we have been living is a prehistory of the human. Okay? What we actually need to live is the first true existence of the human, which involves us moving beyond Western bourgeois bourgeois man. But the beyond there becomes important rather than the idea of the return. Okay? Um, so the non non norm um, becomes a way of understanding the imprisonment of our consciousness caused by Western bourgeois man. And the reason why African diaspora populations and black experience is so important is because black people have paid the highest psycho-existential price for the Euro-American West victory. They're not the only ones who have been brutally exploited by it, but they have paid the highest psycho-existential price. Look at what they're saying in the 19th century under scientific racism about black bodies, okay? About the body, think about Sarah Bartman, you know, and the potent of Venus. Think about all of these images of the blackness, okay? And what blackness represents on the great chain of being. Um, and that's why we need the category of the non-norm, you know, as a way, as you said, of understanding how the binary gets constructed, but not to say then that we settle in to um, saying that we are the non-norm, you know, and, um, and solidify that binary. Let me try to get students to understand. This is a key to understand the Caribbean. Uh, I'm not certain people sitting here understand what, what, what is going on, all right? And to say the Caribbean is constituted by colonialism means other places were not, correct? Correct? In other words, the entire plantation economy and so on brought people from different parts of the world, settled in the Caribbean, right? So that was part of the colonial operation, right? Whereas in Africa, in Asia, these places, there's something come before colonialism, yes? So when people begin to think about the outside, there has always been an outside, right? Before the colonial era, to imagine, or something still going on. It's not completely constituted by, by colonialism, right? So the African situation is radically different from the Caribbean. That's why the Caribbean black, imagine like Rastafarianism, imagine Ethiopia is the way to fight back, right? Symbolically, that's where we resort to, and so on, right? But the entire thing wrapped within the Caribbean. So th that's why, Aaron, that's how I understand. You need to find a different way for decolonization, right? Now, in East Asia, people are thinking in terms of revitalizing the old tradition and all that, historically and geographically, right? So this is one way to, to understand the huge difference. Right? So how do you then, uh, if you're constituted by that, what are the uh, possibilities? Right? So, so now this get into the question of the human. And you, earlier on, if you, if you hear, listen carefully, black what were subhuman, yes? So they get caged in Paris. You, you know what I mean, as animal, 
So that was what is, so re, how do you reconstitute human? But the very act of putting blacks in cage, I don't know whether it's a human behavior or subhuman behavior, uh, depends on how you look at it, right? I mean, so uh, the very notion of beyond, right? Moving beyond the turn of so called European humanism is to rethink <coughs> what is it to be human, right? And I my, my, my guess would be winter would not give you a definite answer, right? But that's how we think beyond, beyond the existing limits, mm -hmm. right? So what would be the, uh, either the outside of the existing boundary mm -hmm. or uh, in terms of the uh, time, of the, at least this is what I try to understand. I mm -hmm. think it's extremely enlightening in the sense that we need to radical, I, I'm, I'm not a political economist, right? But how do we understand the relation between factory and plantation? I think lots of probably slavery, this historian of slavery has to think, right? So the dominant Marxist understanding of capitalism is workers in the factory. But when workers historically working in the factory, what is the relation of the workers in the field, in the plantation, which is possession? You know, Aaron trying to point out, right? I mean, you're, you're, you are slavery, this is a property, right? Rather than I'm selling my labor, right? So there must theoretically and historically, I don't know how people theorize these relations. In other words, plantation and factory, and even thought about uh, by Marx himself, right? These seem to be, if you think in Marx's term, this is a global capitalism, it's one unit. So, so this plantation economy, and these two are collaborating you know, with, with each other. Right? But if you take the plantation model as, I don't know even whether you want to explode the notion of capitalism you know, or something, right? at least on the uh, uh, global economic terms. I mean, what would be that, uh, I think there must be some work being done, you know, in oh, certainly. Yes, certainly. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, certainly there is the idea of going back at least to C.L.R. James' The Black Jacobins, that enslaved people working on the plantations within the new world were living a modern existence um, long before um, the 19th century European workers. Um, in terms of the questions of are the ideas of alienation from production, the fact that they were working within a highly mechanized industry. Because you see, people think of a plantation, a ship of plantation, they think about working in fields, and then they have all these ideas, strange ideas about um, European class um, and European labor um, dynamics and practices. Um, but they don't understand the nature of how the sugar cane plantation worked. Uh, first of all, the process of creating sugar out of cane is a highly mechanized process. Even after you cut that cane, you have to produce sugar from it within a few days. If not, the quality of the sugar in the cane rapidly deteriorates. Okay? Um, involve the pro so there's a highly technical process involved in doing it. But also, even the dynamics of transatlantic slave trade you have a situation in which capital from Europe is acquiring labor from Africa, which is producing a new commodity of product in the new world, which is then being sold to Europe. And the commodity in the new world is being produced by labor from Africa, which is actually um, being kept alive via the um, importation of food stuff from um, North America. Okay? It's a fantastic transnational process which is actually taking place. And it's not just a peripheral place um, 
situation which is taking place in one or two countries of the outs of outposts of the world economy. This is central to the actual functioning of the world economy at that point in time. Okay? So um, it is actually in many ways a particular doctrinaire uh, Marxist conceit only which can see uh, which can speak and have and publish books on the origins of capitalism with only with only a glancing mention of slavery, okay? Um, because it's constitutive of the process of thinking through these things. Um, and of course, um, there's Eric Williams's famous book, Capitalism and Slavery, in which he makes the argument, the much debated argument, that the decline and the end of slavery in the New World was fundamentally due to um, the fact that slavery had become an unprofitable institution. Okay? It wasn't due to British abolitionism, it was due to the fact that slavery had become an unprofitable institution. Um, and therefore, the planter class in the House of Commons in Britain actually was losing a great deal of their power. And also, um, their, let me see, the, the shift could actually take place. Um, from um, let me see, from slave-based economy to wage to wage to a wage economy, um, due to the fact that slavery is becoming um, fundamentally profitable. Again, it's been a highly controversial um, thesis, but it's never been overthrown as a historical thesis. Okay, so I think that um, there is that work and uh, that has been done by a number of radical black intellectuals since the 1930s and the 1940s. It has, of course, not gained mainstream consensus and interest um, in um, the great um, citadels of <laughs> um, the Western Academy in um, Europe and North America. Well, how do you expect anything to? Okay, okay. really. Um, well, let's see, what works by black intellectuals do they take seriously? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, um, that, that's, that's, that's the nature of what goes on at the Cambridge's and Oxford's and the Harvard's and various other stuff. They're producing a particular kind of knowledge. Um, so I, I certainly think that uh, Winter and the argument that she's making here, and she of course cites those figures, is um, tying herself into ooh, um, a large uh, black tradition um, which has been in existence for a, um, a long period of time. Yes? Uh, may, may I? Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Um, Well, I tell you, this is what uh, India and this Korean uh, area is a typical example of a, a, a primitive accumulation Marx also dealt with in his capital and also concerning uh, uh, colonial uh, uh, and also this uh, appropriation of land and labor, human labor and the land. But my question is actually, uh, we, we all also study this uh, collaborative or collaboration with colonial institute or uh, incorporation of colonial institute uh, through local uh, bourgeoisie, okay, uh, such as uh, competitors or factory masters or plantation field masters. So they serve as a middle blank, uh, middleman or, or harbor master. Okay, so so they actually benefit uh, uh, huge, hugely through the uh, uh, transactions between the foreign or the, the colonial masters and local people. But in Caribbean society, it seems that there's no such kind of uh, bourgeoisie, like a black bourgeoisie in mm -hmm. class. But after generations, do they climb up and serve as a similar kind of uh, colonial uh, position to their local people? Mm. So, um I think that um, part of the point of the work that I've been discussing is, is that um, Marx's, um, Marx's category of primitive accumulation um, isn't quite enough to explain uh, the dynamics of the plantation economy. It's a very different kind of argument that Winter, C.L.R. James, and Aaron Williams and others are actually making about it. They're actually making an argument that goes beyond the primitive accumulation argument of Marx. Because primitive accumulation, of course, becomes a step before capitalism. Um, the uh, leading thinkers here are actually claiming that the plantation economy um, and the plantation was firmly an important part of capitalist production at that point in time, rather than basically primitive accumulation. 
Now, in terms of the question of the black bourgeoisie in the Caribbean, um, certainly um, in... Just, yes. Uh, 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 yeah. For, for Marx uh, or for us, uh, yes. primitive civilization is happening uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. it, it's yes. a space for uh, capitalist uh, or uh, mm -hmm. relative uh, accumulation of uh, value and so on. But primitive mm -hmm. accumulation could, could collect a land taking mm -hmm. and labor uh, using it. Uh, well, that's the nature of Caribbean, right? I mean, the, how do you accumulate uh, capital? So it depends on historical that's theory. My question. That's my right? question. That's a class. So it is the European colonizer brought in the slavery, mm -hmm. right? The slaves themselves cannot accumulate. After independence, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, well, I mean, after independence, well, um, C.L.R. James has a very good article that he wrote at the moment of independence called The West Indian Middle Classes. And um, in many ways, it echoes uh, Fanon's better known critique of the uh, <coughs> bourgeoisie. Um, I mean, remember, Fanon refers to them in the newly independent countries. Fanon, in the direction of the earth, writing from 1961, is going to say that they're more of a greedy little caste than anything else. Okay? They have the mind of a huckster. They have the, um, their historic mission, Fanon is going to say, is to say intermediary between the local masses and the metropolitan um, uh, neo-colonial uh, forces. And I think that remains one of the best ways of seeing um, the, um, the fact that you don't really have a bourgeoisie, yes, um, in, in most of the Car um, Caribbean countries. What you have are, is a middle strata, certainly, but you don't have a bourgeoisie, and this middle strata um, was in formation even before the end of slavery, because some slaves were manumitted. But certainly in that hundred years, as I described, from 1830s to 1930s, just thinking for a moment about the Anglophone Caribbean. Again, um, we sometimes have to divide by like, island or linguistic um, territory simply because the histories are so different. Histories of the Dominican Republic, for example, are, are Haiti in terms of class formation, are completely different from the Anglophone Caribbean. So the Anglophone Caribbean groups, not because I want to privilege it, but because um, the, the colonialism and the various colonial forces did reduce the territories to a certain governmental singularity. So in terms of the nature of how things work, um, uh, they can be grouped. Um, so what happens then is that um, in between the 1830s and the 1930s, there is a tentative emergence of a black uh, middle class, mainly um, or forged through the professional trades, um, um, by dint, in some cases, of Herculean, um, let me see, good um, hard work, um, luck, chance, various other things. There is a small professional class that has emerged. Now, with the 1930 social reforms, things like the expansion of education, health services, and stuff like that, I mean, I've seen the actual figures from the 1940s, and it's amazing. When I look at, let's say, the infant mortality rates in Barbados in the 1940s, um, I forget even where they are. I think it was like something like what, 150 and every 1,000 births or something. You know, very, very incredibly high numbers and stuff. Um, when you look at those figures, 50, 60 years later, they're like 12 per thousand, um, 12 per thousand births. They're actually on the level of North American countries, and they managed to achieve that. The, um, the late colonial governments run under universal adult suffrage by the black middle classes, and then the post-independent state managed to achieve incredible health and social transformations for their population literally in just 50 years. So it was a really quite outstanding achievement, you see? Um, so that's why even though they deserve critique, um, they actually did achieve uh, significant things. And of course, this also resulted in an incredible transformation of the class dynamics within the society. Now, um, uh, my country, Barbados, for example, until two years ago, when they finally gave in due to um, the um, incredible turmoil in our economy as a result of the global recession, for the first 50 years, uh, for 50 years, we have had free tertiary education from bachelor's straight through to PhD at my university at home. I did my bachelor's and my master's um, 
free for having to pay any tuition fees. I wouldn't be here if I hadn't had, if I didn't have those. And many other people benefited. It has produced um, over two generations a very large black middle professional class in the country because people can see clear class ascendancy within one generation from being poor to basically being a doctor or a lawyer, you know, or, or whatever else. Um, so at a, at a highly accredited international university. So, um, so certainly there has been that growth, but that black middle class um, is certainly not a bourgeoisie, it certainly doesn't control the factors of production, and really in terms of real wealth, often does not actually have real wealth, um, real reproducible wealth. Um, uh, so, um, so yeah, so that's what I would say in terms of uh, class formation. Now, um, you have also had though a, um, a elite class that has been there for centuries. Um, some white, um, let me see, mostly white, um, some Midli, some um, Syrian and Lebanese, I mean some Syrian and Lebanese businessmen who've moved in and have um, done very well. Um, in Trinidad and Guyana, the class ethnic um, dimension would be different also. Um, and, um, but that class has maybe benefited, um, especially historically, from the control of goods and services that move into the country, organizing um, monopolies or oligopolies, and um, making their money off, the, off arbitrage, basically, the difference between what they're buying goods from and what they're selling goods from. Um, and the control of, um, of those markets, and that's how they have made their profits off the uh, population. Um, and a great, great deal of them have made a good deal of their profits in the 20th century and beyond. Okay? So um, as I always tell my students, you need to understand that when you talk about, let's say, um, the white ruling class within this country, many of them do not, um, let me see, let me see, cannot trace back their money to slavery. Okay, that's in the There are still some families who can, but no, most of them cannot. Most of them have made their money from um, social and economic apartheid policies in the early 20th century, the first half of the 20th century, in which they still control the state in many ways, you know, and they've managed to perpetuate that um, over the last um, two generations. Um, so yeah, so um, that is, um, the, um, that, those are some points, or some notes some of give about the economy. Um, one of the things that we're seeing, which is both fascinating and also troubling, um, is a neoliberal push towards entrepreneurship. Okay, and we know the whole um, neoliberal canard about entrepreneurship um, is part of, of course. Um, the state and private institutions wanting to divorce themselves from the social responsibility of taking care of people within the state. Um, but it's really actually been a big rallying cry, um, and it's been taken up by a lot of younger people um, within the Caribbean over the last 10 or 20 years, um, partly because they um, want to be, they see it as being in control of their own destiny and being in control of their, um, um, and having their own businesses. But um, it's become quite a phenomenon, and um, it also, um, as neoliberal as the idea often is and how it's expressed, it is also for these people resulted in a very different kind of consciousness, and particular class consciousness, than their parents would have had before. So a particular kind of notion of black social respectability has very much declined in that generation um, uh, because they're not going into a civil service or a professional class kind of occupation. It's about the art of the deal and, and, and other things. Um, and in some ways that upend certain social mores in a positive way, even though um, the general drift and consequence of that uh, push towards entrepreneurship is fundamentally a new level. Uh, it's a um, um, different issue, mm -hmm. land, land and sea. Mm -hmm. um, if we, okay, if we take as a presupposition that uh, the Caribbean is an archipelago, mm -hmm. it is obviously it is. Mm -hmm. So this means that the main element is sea and not land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In terms, I borrow from uh, Kashmir. 
then and see here. And uh, as uh, Schmidt has shown, uh, convincingly, hmm? is it English? Convincing in a convincing way. Convincing way. Yes. Yes. Convincing sure. way. In yeah. a very convincing way. Cool. Now Schmidt has shown. Oh, okay. Have oh, okay. uh, 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 you been translated book or something? Or? Hmm? Which book? Ah, which book? Yeah. Land and Sea. So Land and Sea. Oh, okay. So, okay. so uh, there is a problem in the relation between sea mm -hmm. and sovereignty. Yeah. It's not so easy to develop sovereignty on sea. Yeah. You know, there's a famous old book on that, which is Freedom of the Sea by mm -hmm. the Dutch uh, grocers. So, um, the question would be, uh, could this be an explanation for the, let's say, the, the weakness of the rather fragile character of the microstates in the Caribbean? Mm. And related to that, um, if you take things from the angle of C, you see everything completely differently. This is what, for example, uh, Marcus Redica. Are you familiar with yes. Marcus, Marcus Redica? Yes. 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 So, if you say, okay, there is another, let's say, hidden uh, proletariat or working class, mm -hmm. the sailors, the workers of the sea, the workers on the sea. And if you write the history of the West from that angle, not yeah. right there in industry, but on the sea, yeah. Yeah. you see things completely different, differently. So uh, it's a question, will it be possible to write some sort of a counter history of the Caribbean yeah. from the angle of the sea or from the perspective of the sea? all these stories about uh, pirates and all this thing. Yeah. I'm asking this because maybe here yeah, our sure. friend had mm -hmm. the same problem. Mm -hmm. This is an island, yeah. which means that the main element is not as <laughs> all their politicians believe. Men, you yeah. see, and they have this problem that they are ruled or they were ruled. See, they are ruled by people who are mainlanders who have been imported with their own illusions on what ruling is, but ruling on the mainland and ruling on an island is not. But for example, I just just one example. Uh, one of uh, their most interesting heroes here is a pirate, Koshinga, the pirate, much more sympathetic hero than let's say Shanghai Czech. Okay. <laughs> but uh, you know, Indonesian upkeep. Yes, it's the opposite story, right? It's constituted by islands. There are also uh, Asian Mediterranean, okay, for thousands of years. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, the Asian Mediterranean, I haven't heard that particular kind of phrase, so, so yeah, yeah, that's what I'm like. Yeah, books on it. Yeah, yeah, books. Oh, books on it, okay. Yeah. Is that um, specifically thinking about the Philippines then? Uh, the Asian no, 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 from, from uh, uh, like, uh, Japan, mm. uh, Okinawa, Taiwan, down mm. to Southeast Asia. Uh, okay. Okay. So all this, uh, the, the traffic of yes. commerce has mm. been started from the like, fourth or fifth century. And mm. uh, several uh, four cities are uh, highly developed mm. uh, in uh, very early on, mm. uh, much mm. earlier than the uh, 16th century. Several cities were uh, as large or even larger than European cities. Of course, yeah. yeah. So the dominant narrative here yeah. is that capitalism developed in this part of the world along the sea coast, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Mm -hmm. The island. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of story being told. Oh, no, no, that's fascinating. But um, yeah, I mean, um, you're you're putting forth a, a number of perspectives that I think are. Um, Really fascinating because when I think about Caribbean thought, and um, as you can see in those three <coughs> large readers, I mean, thinking a lot around the Caribbean intellectual tradition over the last few years, there is this fascinating perspective um, on the sea that goes into the, becomes part of the literary imagination, particularly thinking about the poetry of Walcott. Um, I remember Campbell Brathwood writing in some very fascinating ways about um, 
the seascape and uh, how people look out from an island, you know, and even view other islands and uh, how, I mean, there's even that idea that some people have that the consciousness is different um, in the islands where they can see another island off of the coast than in the islands in which they can't, like Barbados and Jamaica in which they can because they think that um, Barbados and Jamaica are more insularly national than the islands that can see someone else, you know, from off the, from the coast and stuff. There are a number of interesting perspectives on that. Um, I um, can't really uh, respond to you directly. It's something that I would like to explore further, this idea of a country history of the Caribbean from the sea and how what would cause one to think about the Caribbean because even eco-criticism from the perspective of the Caribbean, it's really now a field that's just developing. There's a, I just went to the book launch of a um, book on Caribbean environmental and the literary eco-criticism um, that took place on my campus, um, I believe it was late last year. Um, and, I'm, and it's a fascinating area of interest which um, one would think that there is going to be, there would be a lot more on because the environmental question in small territories is so pressing and so important. I mean, the island that I live on, Barbados, is 166 square miles, which means that at its longest point is 21 miles, at its widest point is 14 miles, okay? There's no place in Barbados which, unless you're in bumper to bumper traffic, that you cannot drive to any other place in the island in 50 minutes, okay? You can't have a one hour drive in Barbados going from one place to the other unless you're stuck in traffic, okay? <laughs> Mind you, some of the traffic is horrendous because it has some of the most dense, you know, um, traffic per person um, network in the world. Um, but yeah, so um, when you have almost um, 285,000 or so people living on it, it's, um, I think, the most densely populated independent country in the Western Hemisphere, okay? and um, certainly um, one of the most densely populated um, countries in the world. Um, I know I'm speaking in an island which is also um, uh, highly densely populated, but um, what that actually means in terms of the environmental question um, theorized directly is fascinating. We have a, um, at my university, we have a center for environmental and resource management um, and uh, people get masters and do PhDs in there, but it's very much coming out of the side of science disciplines, okay? What is fascinating is, is that there's not much of a conversation across with people like myself who do work more on Caribbean thought or Caribbean philosophy across to what um, theorizing that or thinking through those kinds of questions to me is seen very much as a natural resource management and a science kind of issue for people who have first degrees in biology and chemistry, but of course it's something that affects us all and, um, and uh, will be a real productive um, way to think um, in, in a term for uh, a number of levels. So yeah, um, I, I'm fascinated by the question and I do want to think about it more. Let me enter here, I don't know, when I think about it, especially bringing the Taiwan question into the picture, right? But Koshinga came here, it's before, before European modern, before the birth of the notion uh, in this area of sovereignty. Yes? So there was no problem of sovereignty. So to think you know, historically, from Karl Schmitt's point of view, that's almost like an imposition on this territory, on this uh, geographical zone. Right? Still, he had to kick out the Dutch, right? And this is a matter of sovereignty. No, no, no. The Dutch, how could Dutch claim sovereignty? Because there was no notion of sovereignty. It's an occupation, right? Military force on force, right? It, so that before, uh, even, I mean, before the, sort of the republics constituted by the modern notion of sovereignty, right? But those era, sovereignty did not even register. And In so, the head of the Dutch, it was already a matter of Yes, sovereignty. but now for Koshinga. Yes, of course. Right? So when Koshinga and so on coming into this picture, it wasn't come with those ideas, this is our sovereign, sovereign rights, and so on. 
That's where but the culture was. Because it's sovereignty in terms of modern state, but for them, yeah. for him, it's a recovery of the main dynasty state. <laughs> but that's not the notion of sovereignty, it's a different one. Carl Schmitt hinges on the notion of sovereignty, right? That's between the land and the sea. That was the argument put forward, right? I, I hear, unless I'm, I misunderstand so, For that, example, uh, right? East India Company, they, they colonized two provinces in India. It's uh, their local authority over the state, uh, over the provinces. They get taxation. Which period are you talking about? Dutch, yeah. 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 I'm talking in terms of Western patterns. Yes. It starts from the very beginning. Uh, I mean, without any uh, law apparatus or anything. It's just an image, a myth, a story, a narrative. It's a story about Rome, Romulus and Remus. I draw a line and this is my city. And sovereignty already exists. And if you transgress, I kill you. And that's it. So the model exists from the very beginning. Yeah. In the West. In the West, I agree with you. In the West. No, but, but in Asian countries, there are also similar modes of domination. In domination always exists. And as sovereignty. Okay. Domination always exists. Through conquering. But the, through conquering, that's one thing. But the notion of sovereignty is a different story. Right? Oh, this abstraction. Okay. Connected okay, to the modern okay. nation state. The, right? the, the European emperor, modern nation state the invented. And the system, it's so that, that, that's that's mafia. Mafia have, have territory but no sovereignty. Right? No, this is the imposition I don't accept. But the, the idea of uh, sovereign state after uh, the West Valley, uh, yes. That's a limited uh, concept. More modern, or we can call it uh, modern, but limited concept of uh, sovereignty. Uh, but uh, a more broader uh, something, you know, uh, like in Rome, maybe uh, a tribal leader or something yeah. who can uh, have the power to decide uh, the life of death. death. <laughs> then that's uh, that's a sovereignty. So with this uh, broader idea of the sovereignty, uh, you know, mafia in Sudan. That's a from a. Roman Empire perspective. That's yeah, what I'm that's saying. A, that's a broader but why do we need that concept to impose on different history? That's what I'm saying. You can use domination, you can say rule forces, right? military conquer, but that very concept as ex analytical concept become problematic in this instance to explain but the land and the sea. Sovereignty, you can use a Chinese term to express the what? same idea. What is it? <laughs> the, the, the order of the emperor is as heavy or serious as a heavenly uh, man, man That's mandate. a different order. You don't need the notion of sovereignty. I have to die when, right? when he wants me to die, or I have to. <laughs> For me, it's not that simple. Because you say you propose domination of sovereignty. No, no, no. No, no, no. I, what I mean is, there was no such concept. You can use other terms to describe, not necessarily domination, right? The, the reality went down. Right? But once you evoke Carl Schmitt, right, in terms of land and sea, with the notion of sovereignty, that already presupposes certain formation, right? Which I call the modern nation state. Right? So that's one system of thought. And now gets you know, imposed upon other historical reality. That's what I'm resisting. Okay. I know that. I know yeah. you resist the superimposition of Western concepts on local reality in yes. Asia. Okay, I agree with you on that. But uh, what makes things more complicated mm -hmm. is that first of all, concepts travel. And concepts travel both directions. Yes. Not only from west to the east, but yes, also yes. To, from yes. the east to the west. Yes. We, many of my people from my generation were Maoists in the 70s of last century and borrowed a lot from Mao Zedong's theory. I agree. Okay. So I concepts agree. travel the other direction. I agree. But you're talking about Koshinga. Yes. You need to historicize. You flatten out history. You know? you so we are borrowing contemporary concepts to map the historical past, which didn't work that way. That's all I'm saying. 
Right? Yes. No, but how can you can marry? Yes. How can you be so sure that in the head of somebody like Koshinga, of people who were related to him in the Chinese Empire, had nothing in common in their head with a notion like what Schmidt calls nomos? That is the base of the law. The law, that law in a very primitive sense, proto law, which is which means in this context, this belongs to us, not to you, the Dutch. It belongs to us. It is our land. This is our land. And if you say that, if you think if you think in these terms, you already have in your head some sort of notion of nomos. And okay, you say, no, it's not nomos because nomos is Western. Okay, I completely agree with you. It's Western. So it's something else in Chinese. I don't know what, but I'm sure something of that kind exists in Chinese too. Then you, you, tell, you tell me. Faya. You tell me. Bantua di Gua regain my land. Yes, yes. Well, so uh, what? This is my law. So what? This is, so the, this, is a, the this is the analytical notion we are talking about. Sure, right? sure, yes, sure, sure. Yes. Yes. So, uh, see, the Mongolian extended its empire over the Euro Asia from so called mainland China. Okay, this is a land taking and to reinforce the, the, the law, okay, extended from the central palace. So this is well, this is what I tried. Let's return to the context <laughs> of the conversation, right? That but was talking about Wait, let me, finish. Let, me, the let me finish my of the main Let me finish my point. Okay. Right? The point was the content of the conversation. Right? It's called Schmidt's notion of land and the sea. Use that the notion of sovereignty to explain why the situation in the Caribbean. That was the context of the conversation starts. Right? Then you evoke, that's why Taiwan get into trouble, partly because this mainlander coming over here from the mainland's perspective. That was the conversation. Okay. Yes, that's what I'm contesting. Okay. Yeah, I'm not and e to es evoke. especially evoking like Oshinda, <laughs> those histor. We need to. All I'm saying, we need to historicize first, rather than theoretically say this is the case. Right. And I'm saying once historicizing whether that concept works or not. That's all I'm saying. Okay. That was the context of the argument. Okay. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I get that. I, I've not read um, the actual text that, um, by Carl Schmidt on Land and Sea, but I'm very um, interested in how productively that particular idea mm. of thinking about the sea could be used in terms of the context of the Caribbean. Um, especially when we think about the fact that, you know, it, it's fascinating just in a simple way. When you Acts about definitions of the Caribbean. One of the things I used to do with my um, Canadian students when I was doing my PhD in teaching as a teaching assistant, I would ask them, um, how do you define the Caribbean? What's the Caribbean? And that became an interesting question because we then talked about what was in the Caribbean. Some people would just say islands, and then we would talk about mainland territories like Belize and Diana, which are often seen as constitutively part of the Caribbean. Then. And we'd have an interesting discussion about that. Um, I would then ask them what do you consider the population of the Caribbean to be, and people will start to guess all kinds of outlandish numbers. Um, and I said, okay, uh, we would come to a point which I said, okay, if we, it depends on definitions, of course, of what the Caribbean is, but if we want to take a relatively narrow definition and we just say the islands, okay, and these two or three mainland territories, Diana or Belize, we're talking about a population of somewhere around 35 million. And I remember one time a student gasped and said, wow, that's the population of Canada. And I said, yeah, it is, okay. But all of the Caribbean islands and those mainland ter uh, territories could fit into Ontario or Quebec quite easily because uh, Canada is so vast. Um, but the one interesting thing that I don't recall us really dwelling on is the idea of why focus on the territories rather than thinking more about the question of the sea, okay? Or thinking from that perspective of the majority of the geographical space that we were exploring in the context of the definition um, is space which is immersed by the 
So, um, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated at the idea and at least thinking with the idea more, you know, and tracking with the idea more. So I think you would have, have appreciated from my earlier comments. So thank you for it. Yeah. What else? Sure. I'm trying to associate uh, two things that we, we were talking about uh, earlier. Uh, the one thing is sort of uh, U.S. empire, yes. uh, but I'm not thinking of uh, uh, empire by uh, military strength or the diplomatic approach, uh, but uh, the empire of fun. Of fun? Fun. F-U-N. Uh, yeah. Uh, or we can say that uh, the empire, which uh, by its uh, soft power, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> that uh, becomes the uh, hegemony of, uh, uh, of the 20th and mm -hmm. the first century. Uh, this is one, one thing. And the other uh, thing is uh, the so called black experience. Um, uh, yeah, the black experience, uh, either in, in uh, urban ghettos uh, or in plantations. Black uh, happiness or uh, uh, black pain. Uh, black music, blue, jazz, uh, soul, reggae, all those things, and uh, sports celebrities, uh, and all these things. How these things are uh, being successfully exploited or appropriated by that empire of fun. Yeah. And then, uh, Make it uh, the cultural hegemony that uh, it's proven so powerful during the co uh, co Cold War, actually. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah, with jazz particularly. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, yeah. uh, right. Uh, I'm curious about this, uh, uh, particularly, uh, I have a comparative term. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking of uh, the rising, uh, but still less than empire, which uh, China. Uh, now, uh, rising power in terms of the manufacture or uh, non, uh, in general, general. Yeah. But it seems that uh, China facing those uh, difference uh, differences, in, uh, you know, toward like uh, Tibetans or Uyghur, mm -hmm. uh, always always have that kind of uh, paranoia, paranoia. Uh, Decision and never uh, can have a uh, land in order to have a kind of fun uh, so successfully explore the, 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 the difference of those uh, uh, those things. Uh, yeah. So I'm contrasting this uh, this uh, uh, these two case and uh, and how does how does uh, see the uh, yeah the, the, the differences or black expressions uh, in I think in, 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 that, yeah, so yeah. in addition to what uh, she said, just one thing, could you add some comment on the, the issue of athletics? Because it's very important that you call region. In the, um, within the empire of fun, what you call the empire. Because it, it's a very important issue, I think, for the Caribbean athletics. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of interest there. Um, certainly, I mean, um, it's funny, I was having the uh, lunch of a recently arrived um, ambassador um, to the Eastern Caribbean. I prefer not to say what country uh, uh, last year. And she was expansively telling me, yes, uh, my country, we are concerned with soft power. So what we want to do is, you know, do this and that. Mind you, I was trying to get some money out of a sort of soft power for scholarships from students um, from the Caribbean to go and study in her country. But you know, um, the, the, the gaze started to shift and the words became more ambiguous when I started to talk about our core questions of money and financing, you know. Um, soft power without money is always um, something which is preferred. So I, I think that's a very important um, point you're raising in terms of the question of how cultural hegemony actually secures itself in the Caribbean. Now, um, I recently, it will be out in about three weeks, have done the fourth and last one of those readers uh, that have been going around the room. It's on Caribbean popular culture. Um, it's called Caribbean popular culture, politics, performance, and, oh dear, I've forgotten the title of my own book. <laughs> uh, 
power, politics, and performance. Caribbean popular culture, power, politics, and performance. Yeah. It's 707 pages long, okay? It is, it was the most exhausting projects I've ever gone through. But um, one of the things that we found fascinating about doing it, myself and my co-auditor, Yanni Hume, was the extent to which when we thought and we worked through the popular culture of the region, Many of the articles may have alluded at one point, uh, or may have mentioned briefly questions of um, cultural hegemony from the North, but not really that much, because Caribbean popular culture is so incredibly powerful. And especially in the realm of music, even though I know Caribbean um, people who, let's say, don't like Calypso or don't like reggae, okay? Um, most of them are you not know, teetering on that. Can't talk like both clips, you know. Um, but um, they don't think that Caribbean musical forms, for example, are in any way inferior to North American or European or other Western musical forms. Um, so I think that there is a great deal of pride and a sense of purpose that Caribbean people feel in um, their cultural formations, and of course, this is in partly due to the incredible work and the revalorization of um, the Caribbean um, intellectual tradition and the Caribbean cultural tradition, which has been the critical labor, particularly of that generation of winters being part of. Um, so there has been a change in how people in the Caribbean think about their um, cultural production. Um, we know, for example, in a way that we did not know in 1950, that there is a thing called Caribbean literature, and a very great and wonderful thing called Caribbean literature. We know that Caribbean music is all around the world, okay? And, um, and that, that music um, is a, a very profound and wonderful um, contribution that the Caribbean has made to the world. Um, so I think that that is known and understood and appreciated by Caribbean people and has been actually one of the more successful forms of the decolonization movement. I do think though, however, in other spheres, um, the impact has been a little more limited and a little more difficult. One of those spheres would be television, for example. I remember once hearing that, um, and I've never been able to verify this by both studying um, like mass media, even like cultural studies, that um, one of the reasons why a number of Eastern Caribbean countries and smaller islands um, got so many US television cable stations um, being to their countries in, from the 1980s was a specific State Department imperative in which it was facilitated by the State Department because the idea was that if they're watching all of our television shows and all of our comedies and all of our dramas, we don't have to do any kind of real ideological work um, to keep them non-communists because they're going to be imbibing those kind of capitalist ethos and understandings all the time. Um, that was explained to me one time by someone who was in the know, and he said that our ministry is still a little longer than some of the other countries. I'm not certain if that's true, but it actually um, sounds very much like um, part of the play of um, the, um, the State Department. So I think that, yes, the ability of the United States entertainment complex to globalize a particular idea of fun or okay, entertainment, but they put device in a place that Las Vegas. I mean, um, I've been to Vegas a couple of times um, because I had a very good friend living there, not because I, I always thought I would never miss her, I would never have any interest in being in Vegas, so okay, but I ended up going to as a good friend who's there. Um, but the interesting thing about that was the fact that um, Vegas is such a place of entertainment rather than a place of um, culture. So I would always prefer to be in a New York or a London where I can go to museums, or obviously there's museums and various kinds of things. Well, Vegas is shows, okay? But that's one of the things that America has very successfully been able to actually export and globalize as an understanding of fun and an understanding of legend. And I think that, yes, that has actually been one of the more difficult um, cultural features of US empire to, um, to overcome and to deal with. Um, I guess on this question of, um, let me see, 
how black happiness, black pain, how they're successfully expropriated, how black cultures are successfully expropriated, appropriated. Um, I interrupted you and said this is speak about jazz, and of course jazz is one of the best examples of that, the way that Louis Armstrong and some other African-American jazz musicians were used um, in the Cold War as part of these jazz tours by the US government. And people like, um, I forget her name right now, but she wrote Race Against Empire. Um, a, and then another one's a book called Satchmo Blows Up Road. Penny Von Eschen, I believe it was, um, was her name. And she's written um, well on those kinds of questions, and I'm sure others, um, on, the, on, on that use of African Americans to further the project of the um, US empire. In terms of athletics, um, we also, of course, have the old imperial game in the Caribbean, which we changed and which was very important in the Anglophone Caribbean. I'm thinking, of course, of cricket, and we may be aware of the incredible success of the West Indies cricket team for a couple of decades, um, for certainly from the 1970s to the 1990s. But that has um, uh, transformed itself, uh, dissipated so significantly over the last two decades um, that um, it simply doesn't hold the same space that it did in the Anglophone Caribbean imaginary um, uh, that it once did and it did for many years. I mean, um, cricket becomes important in Anglophone Caribbean because it's certainly the space, as Hilary Rettles has pointed out, that Caribbean people have made one of their greatest cultural investments. Um, but um, that has started to shift and started to change. I think that athletics, even though <coughs> athletics is not as continual, I mean, the World Championships is every two years, the Olympics is every four years, but the kind of rallying around um, Caribbean athletes and the um, you see the pride in um, throughout the region in Jamaican athletes, particularly his performances over the last 10 years at the Olympics, is um, something of significance. I'm not sure though that I quite see the athletics as playing in to the same kind of, um, I think there's a difference between the fun of the entertainment complex, okay? than the kind of uh, excitement interests of the athletics, especially since athletics is not as seasonal as, let's say, even the, or rather, it's actually more seasonal every couple of years or every four years than the, um, uh, the regular seasonal entertainment complex of the franchise American sports, for example, like the basketball or the hockey or the American football, those kinds of things. So I do see it a little differently, but perhaps also I don't quite understand your point you're making about athletics in your China or all about it. I, yeah. I remember a clip uh, from a film on the um, uh, Black Panther. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a small on the scene and an orator is talking and okay, he said black is beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, the the audience is reaction. Mm -hmm. So everybody mm -hmm. shouts black is beautiful. And now, if you think in these terms, the first picture you see of the first image of it, it's a huge giant ad, Usain Bolt, Nike, or yeah. Adidas, I don't know. Yes, it is. I think I think huge advertisement with okay, a black body, a champion, a champion. And, okay, it has shift the past to something which is the opposite, quite the opposite of what it was at the time uh, that this political matter uh, at the time of the black This is what I mean. Oh yes, I mean certainly there's a very big difference between you see both photo, photo, um, you see photo or advertising that and um, what we are um, what we recall in terms of the um, you never not know what time it is here. Um, <laughs> yes, um, and the very, um, and the iconic image, for example, of the 1968 Olympic Games, you know, with the Black Panther salute by the, um, the athletes, 400 meter runners, I believe it was, to the 400 meter runners uh, from the United States. Um, but again, um, that's also connected to this um, increased commodification of the world in which black bodies and black athletic and um, 
let me see, uncultural production is going to be enmeshed. Um, and I, I would tend to see it in, in, in that respect. Um, you know, um, David Scott, who's the editor of Small Acts, has a very interesting book, a book that I have a number of disagreements with in terms of its agreement of um, its reading of CLRGs. But it's a book called Conscripts of Modernity, The Tragedy of Colonial Enlightenment. And um, it's actually taken, the title is taken from an essay by Tal al Assad, okay, um, the anthropologist. And it's the idea of conscripts of modernity, you know. Um, Scott is applying to blacks within the West, and he says, you know, black people are conscripts of modernity. In other words, the idea that there's conscripts and we're not volunteers, okay. And um, as much as some of these black athletes and these black entertainers are, um, benefiting tremendously commercially from these things. There's also a way in which black bodies, you know, um, don't create the system. There are conscripts, you know. Um, perhaps though there are more volunteers in terms of some of the individuals, but there's a way in which they're conscripted into these things. It's a way of um, you either copyright your image or other people are going to copyright it for you. Um, you either um, try to control the narrative of how you're going to be seen or you you know um, or um, are you going to be used to do other kinds of things you see so um, so yes can we, can we go back to um, winter uh, 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 the, the subtitle yeah. of the uh, black by the book uh, by the book is uh, uh, new natives in a new, in a new, in a yeah. new world a new land New land. New land. Yeah. Okay. And so, I, so one would understand that in relation to American media mm. as the old native, is it? So the new native become the black American from the plantation, which is later than the old native as American Indian. Is it? In other words, how does the how did Winter conceptualize or, or envision the notion of you know, native in relation to whatever? Uh, I, I'm, I'm yeah, curious. No, it's, it's a very important question, and actually, um, I had a the one contributor who didn't manage to finish his essay for the small ass special issue and therefore couldn't be in it, was specifically writing on this question of the indigenous, okay? And the way in which um, winter figures that question of the native. Because I think it's going to be one of the central state places where people take up criticism of the text of the future. And I'm, I mean, I've already had, a, there's a graduate student who's working on those questions at Northwestern University on the same text. I haven't been able to talk with them for a while. And it's going to be interesting to see how other people are, 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 um, go with that question. Because um, Winter's perspective here, um, it will be interesting to see the response to this. She's not trying to displace, in my reading, the Native American, okay? Um, or saying that black people come and take over the role of Native Americans because Native Americans disappear from the historical and contemporary scene. But what she's interested in is the ways in which black people make themselves native to what she calls this area of experience that we call the new world. Okay? So even if I take that first line in a um, in the um, document, sorry, um, I, uh, I must be the type. Um, it is um, black metamorphosis, new natives in a new world. Okay? Not new land. Yeah. Okay? yeah. Um, she says, um, the very first line is that she talks about how um, the point of this manuscript is to explore the historical process, the socio-economic sea change, the cultural metamorphosis by which a multi-tribal African became the native of that area of experience that we term the new world, okay? And really what she's trying to understand is cultural transformation. What I find the most arresting about that sentence is when she talks about native of that area of experience that we call the new world. The idea that the new world is a completely new area of experience. But there is a way in which people who have been alienated, violently alienated from their land, okay, 
um, brought across as chattel, as real estate, as property, find themselves rehumanizing the landscape. There is this uh, wonderful comment by John Price Morris, who is the dean of you know, um, Haitian anthropologists, um, a um, uh, very important late 19th century and early 20th century Haitian thinker, um, who said that we snatched our places among men in the Americas. He talks about the, how the ways in which Haitian people humanize the landscape of America by the kind of work, their productive labor, but they're putting down the roots of their culture within this new space. And that's what Winter is interested in thinking through. However, um, it comes at a time in a historical conjuncture within Black and Native scholarship, in which there are a number of fascinating questions being posed about how to think about those questions of nativity and indigeneity. Okay, um, so there are ways in which sometimes, especially in Caribbean scholarship, black people are loosely referred to as indigenous people, okay, within the Americas or okay, are newly indigenous in a way which is um, problematic because it silences um, indigenous people who existed there before. So it's going to be interesting to see um, whether um, scholars in their response to winter on this um, falter for using the term native, okay, or the ways in which she thinks about um, this question of nativity. But um, I think that she's thinking about it, as we see in some of the folks, in a very kind of anti-colonial praxis. Yeah. So um, when she's saying, for example, it is the natives, all the wretched of the earth who are breaking out of their reservation and are called upon to reinvent the very concept of the human through a restructuring of the whole system. Well, when she's saying the natives, all the wretched, notice the, the key phrase there is also all the wretched of the earth because she's basically saying that blacks become um, native labor in these lands in which um, Native Americans are being violently exterminated you know, from the land and being kicked off of the land. They become now the native labor. Um, in other places where Native people are still there, they can be used as a native labor, okay? Um, but yes, um, so um, it's a perpetuation of a system of control and, and subordination. I think another quotation we had before that, 627, this is the one, Indeed, yes. right? Uh -huh. And this is about the uh, American Indian. It yes. was protracted agony, yeah. right? I think uh, she's talking about these, the earlier... Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm asking the question in, in relation, because then the, uh, the next quotation kind of put all the retired, uh, retired natives all together. Yes. As actually the possibility for creating a new world, mm -hmm. new possibility, mm -hmm. right? So including, so in that sense, mm -hmm. uh, black American become the new native, mm -hmm. whereas the uh, American Indian mm -hmm. was the earlier uh, Indian. Is, is, is that how she understands the situation, right? Now, this is the question behind it. It's actually, um, it's arguable if we think analytical, right? um, because native in relation to the American Indian, the American Indian were, were the natives, mm -hmm. right? and the settler were the, the whites, European whites. Yeah. Right? But the European whites arrived in uh, the continent in the North American continent and brought, mm. brought the African uh, in, yeah. right? So in that sense, if you see, so in other words, uh, European whites or English whites become as native as black America mm -hmm. in terms of the historical relation, right? mm -hmm. in relation to American Indian, mm -hmm. yes? But how do they, so they, I guess what I'm saying is that uh, black American displace or replace the workforce. Or, but in terms of native settler relation, it's, uh, it, it's not an easy one. No, it's just not an easy one. I think right. the winter would be concerned about the question of the relationship of power. I mean, if one occupies a particular role as a settler, okay, um, what does that mean? for one's relationship to the land, okay? Um, one's alienation from the land. And um, also, I mean, um, winter is also coming from a context in Jamaica in which 
Um, the white settlers in Jamaica, um, on many levels, many of them function as absentee landlords. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, they would have the plantations managed for them while they, they live in England. Okay? Mm -hmm. Or there is a lack of relationship on one level to the actual space. See? So um, I think that there is um, that question of whether occupying the role of a colonizer, um, what that means in terms of your relationship to the land, mm -hmm. and whether you actually cons consider yourself then, or can really be um, possibly considered to be a native of that land. The African experience is completely different, right? The native actually had access to it. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Whereas if he, she's referring here to Black America, yeah, especially I'm talking purely from the New World perspective, right? Yeah. But this is a plantation you are actually talking about, right? Yes, mm -hmm. and the land was not accessible to the native, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So called native. Yeah. So then, how can they be called native? Analytically. Well, she's thinking about native in terms of the ways in which it's again, it's like, no, no, but the, the ways in which um, they also humanize the landscape, the ways in which they claimed the space as their own, okay, as a space in which um, they belong to. I think those are the kinds of ideas in which she's thinking about the question of nativity to African space. Then what is the relation between Black American and uh, American Indian? Historically. Historically? Oh, yeah. But that's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, uh, yes, but he did. That's why he said yeah. he used some new natives. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. But what is your relation with the old native? Right? I think it's an absolutely crucial question. Yeah. Otherwise, we're not understanding her. She said this is a new native. Mm -hmm. New to what? You know, new world we understand. Yeah. Right? It is new native must be in relation to American India, especially in this passage you, yeah, you yeah, quoted. Yeah, right? yeah. So how yeah. how does how does she how how did how does she see the relation? Mm -hmm. Except, you know, the ventures of the natives. That part we understand. Mm -hmm. That context almost like the colonized mm -hmm. kind of working together in that sense. Yeah, I, I think that was how she would see it. She would not see it as one superseding the other, okay? Or um, blacks as a new native that simply displace the older native. But she would see um, this is a new set of people who are forced to come to terms with their, with both their subordination in the new landscape, but forging a sense of belonging to this new landscape. Um, it is a contested, a strange, and an alienated belonging to this new landscape. But it is a belonging all the same, okay? Um, and they're coming to terms with that belonging. And that's, why the, that's one of the reasons why she's saying that they um, become the new natives, that they are, they are new natives. Um, uh, but they become new natives because of what the new world represents. It's an area of experience that is a new world. And uh, that's very different from old world sensibilities okay, or experiences. Because um, the new world um, is our set of societies through the displacement of the indigenous populations. Um, in which shadow of um, the shadow of black genocide, the shadow of transatlantic slavery and anti-black violence throughout the Western Hemisphere has created a particular conundrum associated with blackness and blackness's presence. Okay? Um, so for example, one of the things that I found when I was doing Caribbean cultural thought and was thinking about um, the intellectual history of thinking about culture in the Caribbean from the late 19th century through on to the early 21st century, is throughout the territories, the common reoccurring theme historically is this question of blackness and coming to terms with blackness and the ways in which blackness exists as the subterranean roots of the culture within these spaces. So you see that in Cuba. 
great debates in Cuba in the 1910 to 20s onwards about how Cuban culture is based on an African presence. Mm -hmm. Haiti, of course, is always going to be there due to the revolution. Um, it's there in the Anglophone Caribbean, it really only can fully flower that kind of debate in the 1960s, okay, um, with the coming of independence. But um, Cuba and Haiti are far in advance of that because of the fact that they're independent a lot earlier, okay, and also the very rich um, history of Cuban institutions at the University of Havana, which is a you know, hundreds of years old institution. Um, in the Francophone Caribbean, you know, that question is going to come up with negritude um, and, this, and the question of revalorizing an African presence. In other words, it's a persistent theme that oscillates consistently through the Caribbean intellectual tradition there. But it has to do with the spectacular nature of anti-black violence, the fantastic way in which black people are subterranean, but also simultaneously omnipresent um, in the Western imagination. Okay, and they're the foundation of those societies. Yeah. I think we should be moving towards wrapping up now. Yeah. Uh, let me ask time. one yes. last question. Yes. Right? Yeah. You move from alienation to colonization of consciousness. Yes. Mm -hmm. In the context of it, when she uttered the decolonization of consciousness, mm -hmm. what does she mean exactly? Decolonization of consciousness. Decolonization of consciousness. This, this is her major move, right? I mean, yeah. So yeah, well, what she's saying, I think, there, um, in terms of the specific, to clarify the question on colonization of consciousness, is that rather than speaking of alienation, um, we are aware of and we've inherited the particular notion of Marxist concept of alienation. She says, says the black person who sees himself as a Negro, okay? That particular term for defining a black person is uh, not alienated. That doesn't quite capture. They're colonized. And that's why she stops says the colonization of consciousness is something that um, a term or a phrase that she wants to work with, an idea she wants to work with, rather than the idea, the Marxist idea of alienation. As fruitful as it is for describing um, man's relationship within, um, let me see, the capitalist society. Um, I mean, many of us would have read, or hope would have read in Marx's incredible essay on alienated labor, or so sometimes translated as strange labor for the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844. Um, but she's saying there's something more that we need to understand if we're going to think about black experience mm -hmm. and coloniality. Mm -hmm. And that is the colonization of consciousness. Okay? That part uh, I understand. Yes. Yeah. But the decolonization part, yeah. I mean, what is to be done, for instance? Mm -hmm. Only all, all work on an abstract level, or what? She's thinking about something concrete, mm -hmm. right? Or this is the programmatic statement, in terms of the... So the yeah. alienation part is fully... Yes, yeah, so indeed, yeah. Well, I mean, um, One of the things about the flowering of consciousness is that it's not possible to give a blueprint that is going to be suggestive of every way in which um, a consciousness beyond coloniality is going to be reached because coloniality has so many different registers, has so many different ways of interpolating all of our lives, okay? Um, so I think that, um, Winter will guess certain, certain things and certain pathways uh, which have to be forged, but there can no, there can never be any um, yeah, definitive. Um, there can never be um, any, um, you know, um, a set of programmatic statements which are going to, you know, um, end existing coloniality. We're going to make a get a student to get a chance to talk. Huh? But uh, I think that we're and only on the time. Yes. Right? We're going to uh, oh, call break. Yes. Uh, Anyone? Jonathan, one last question? Anyone?
If not, yes, yes, yes. Sorry. So, consciousness is not definite for you, colonized, and will be, to some extent, still colonized in the world I'm looking in. But what about the desire? If the consciousness is colonized, can the desire under this condition be decolonized? Or uh, can the desire in the way uh, it's related to the use and the value of the body have always already have been um, decolonized to some extent? Well, I'm asking because I was thinking about um, the discussion we had yesterday about um, tourism and yes. prostitution and other things that surround um, that particular use of um, body. Mm -hmm. um, I was just thinking, um, of course, there's um, exploitation involved in that particular situation. But then, um, desire is desire. It's like um, the way a body decides another body that something um, that happens before it gets um, explained in the history. So, um, if a colonized mind has to understand uh, a certain use of body as being colonized as well, that doesn't mean uh, a certain practice of desire is itself I mean, it's uh, a friendly question. I should say that um, when Winter is speaking about desire, or she's speaking about desire um, on its large scale, um, desire in terms of aesthetic, taste, judgment, um, value, you know, um, uh, beyond uh, intimate questions of desire. Um, I think she's, she makes the point that And that's based on those ideas of how one sees desire's role in constructing certain um, spheres of value and not value in the world. I think that as a result of that, she's suggesting that um, it's impossible to proceed towards a decol decolonized consciousness without interrogating that with those questions surrounding desire, um, which the bourgeoisie has successfully managed to delimit within our consciousness. It's one of the key factors that um, you know keep us in our place. So um, there is um so there's a question then of what constitutes an appropriate anti-colonial desire, okay? Um, what constitutes a true socialist desire, okay? Um, and by a socialist desire then, um, our, and, and our anti-colonial desire, um, we might think of, um, a free-ranging marketplace for ideas, or marketplace is not the right word, but um, a range of ideas in which the voices of people who are poor, the voices of women, the voices of um, gay people are as acceptable and speak with the same authority as a white bourgeois heterosexual man, for example, okay? Um, we may think of workplaces in which there is um, autonomy and consideration and respect for different opinions. Um, we may think um, of um, the ability to even sometimes listen to the radio or television free of the cant of commercial diatribes, okay? 
and, um, and the salesman's lives. All of those are some of the fascinating questions that we face um, when we think about what constitutes a socialist desire, or what desire may look like under socialism, um, or what desire may look like under anti um, colonialism But I think it's also a sphere of human understanding that perhaps has not been given as much attention as it should. But certainly Winter is um, saying very clearly here that we need to understand it. Okay? And James, in his own way, in American civilization, as Timothy Brennan has very well pointed out, is really obsessed with trying to come to terms with this notion of what constitutes a socialist desire, an appropriate socialist desire. And, um, and he speaks through that question of ledger and happiness and the pursuit of happiness um, in a particularly poignant way here. Um, and the winter is trying on some level to get to the root causes of um, uh, the colonization of desire in order to uh, free us from the um, trappings of the Western culture. So Let so me close this by yeah. saying, relating to this, um, again, you know, important issues of desire. But I think the very fact of um, being here, and let me use this thing, the black and white, colonized, col colonized model, right? I mean, the Bononia. Precisely how do you displace the, the object of desire, which is the whites, right? So in that sense, I think decolonization move is to shift the object of desire. Yeah. So for us, towards the Caribbean, right? towards Africa, towards Arabic world, is a decolonization move. Right? Otherwise, you get caught in the dialectic. Right? So at least that's what I think this project we're trying to uh, move is actually trying to serve properly. I'm not saying there's only one decolonization strategy. right? But with the Bononian thing, with the colonial identification, how do you bring it? Right? So one of the things in relation to the gay and lesbian, you know, with the workers and all that. But what constitutes a socialist desire is precisely those domains, uncharted. Right? In the sense, how do you put your finger on? And the, because the worker capitalist relations still caught in the same thing. So with that, can we thank uh, Aaron for uh, enlightening us? <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Sorry?